No. Ricardo, balança a mão para mim. Ok. Foi um imenso prazer que hoje trazemos a palestra do professor Dr. Neil Leach sobre a arquitetura na era da inteligência artificial no nosso canal português do Digital Futures. Nós vamos ter como convidados no final da sessão um debate com três convidados bem importantes para nós, a Marina Borges da PUC Minas, a Lorena Moreira da UFPA e o José, professor José Pedro Souza da Universidade do Porto. Antes, a gente gostaria de uh, comunicar que todas as nossas, nossas lives, elas são uh, disponíveis, elas ficam disponíveis no, no canal do YouTube do Digital Futures. A gente tem uh, os, uma conta do Digital Futures uh, específica e os canais uh, estão organizados por idiomas também e, e temas. Uh, uh, nos, nos nossos eventos de final de semana, nós teremos amanhã, domingo, a continuação do Doctoral Consortium, com o professor Neil Leach, ainda sobre a, a, a inteligência artificial em arquitetura. Uh, nós temos, dia 25 de novembro, um tutorial em espanhol uh, de Rodini, de arquitetônico procedural, e uh, no dia 26 de novembro, uma sessão de talks com um insider da Universidade de Tonte, do doutorado da Universidade de Tonte. Uh, aqueles que quiseram nos acompanhar, a gente tem aqui, deixa o link da nossa comunidade do Discord e o nosso site do Digital Futures. Então, a nossa, a nosso tema hoje, né, arquitetura na era da inteligência artificial, vai ser a, a, a parte a, do livro do professor uh, Neil Leach, né, Architecture in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, que ainda está em inglês, né, que foi lançado esse ano, e traduzindo em português seria arquitetura na era da inteligência artificial. Uh, nós, então, vamos ter os convidados a, Mar... a professora Marina, a Lorena e José Pedro, que em seguida seremos apresentando. Uh, o professor Neil Leach, ele é professor da uh, Florida International University, Kiel, da Tonge University e da European Graduate School, AGS. Também lecionou em outras instituições, que incluem a Architectural Association de Londres, a IAC uh, de Barcelona, a DIA, Columbia GSAPP, Cornell, Harvard GSB e SIR. Ele também é fundador, cofundador do Digital Futures, acadêmico da uh, Academy of Europe e ganhador de duas bolsas da NASA para pesquisa em tecnologias de impressão 3D para a Louis Marte. Ele publicou mais de 40 livros sobre teoria da arquitetura e design digital, incluindo Rethinking Architecture, The Anesthetics of Architecture, Design for a Digital World, Digital Tectonics, Camouflage, Digital Cities, Space, Space Architecture, Swarm Intelligence, Computational Design, Digital Fabrication, 3D Printed Body Architecture, Architecture in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, tema dessa, dessa nossa sessão. Uh, ainda desse ano, Machine Hallucinations, Architecture and AI e uh, The AI Design Revolution, e o livro que está por vir, The Death, the Death of the Architect, The News of the Profession in the Age of AI. A sessão, ela vai ocorrer, primeiro a gente vai, vai passar um vídeo da, da palestra do professor Neil com legendas em português, e logo após a gente abre para o debate, uh, onde nós vamos ter os seguintes convidados. Certo. A nossa primeira convidada, Marina Borges. Obrigado pela presença, Marina. A uh, Marina é doutora em arquitetura e urbanismo pela UFMG, em teoria, produção e experiência do espaço, mestre em engenharia de estruturas pela mesma instituição. Ela possui graduação em arquitetura e urbanismo, também pela UFMG, e em engenharia civil. Atualmente, ela é professora no curso de Arquitetura e Urbanismo da PUC Minas, coordenadora do curso de pós-graduação em Design Paramétrico em Arquitetura do IEC PUC Minas e arquiteta na Secretaria Municipal de Política Urbana da Prefeitura Municipal de Belo Horizonte. Seu enfoque uh, de pesquisa está na investigação sobre processos digitais de, proce de projeto arquitetônico e planejamento urbano e regional, com o uso de ferramentas computacionais emergentes. A nossa próxima convidada Bom, é a Lorena Moreira. Satisfação, com grande satisfação, a, a segunda convidada é a Lorena Moreira, doutora em Arquitetura, Tecnologia e Cidade pela Unicamp, possui mestrado na Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina, especialização em projeto auxiliado por computador e gra, graduação em Arquitetura e Urbanismo pela Universidade Federal da Bahia. 
professora da Faculdade de Arquitetura da UFBA e integrante do Laboratório Alicaz. Pesquisa na área de tecnologias digitais com foco em realidades mistas, BIM e metaverso. Nosso, nosso próximo convidado. Uh, estamos muito satisfeitos de ter também connosco o José Pedro Souza, que é arquiteto pela Faculdade de Arquitetura da Universidade do Porto, Master em Arquiteturas Genéricas pela Universidade Internacional da Catalunha e doutor em Arquitetura pelo técnico da Universidade de Lisboa. No âmbito do seu doutoramento sobre fabricação digital com cortiça em arquitetura, foi Special Student no Massachusetts Institute of Technology e Visiting Scholar na, Univers na University of Pennsylvania. É interessado na exploração do impacto da tecnologia digital no pensamento, projeto e construção em arquitetura. A sua atividade profissional tem cruzado os domínios da prática, do ensino e da investigação. Depois de ter ensinado em escolas como a ESARC, WIC e a IAC e o Departamento de Arquitetura da FCTUC, é atualmente professor associado na FAUP, onde fundou e dirige o grupo de investigação do Digital Fabrication Laboratory. Desde março de 2021, é membro também da High Level Roundtable da New European Bauhaus. Uh... Nós já vamos dar início ao nosso vídeo. Antes de nada, eu gostaria de agradecer a nossa equipe do Digital Futures Português, que fez a transmissão em especial a Daniela, com seu esforço, uh, que a gente conseguiu, então, completar esse, essa tradução. Obrigada, Daniela. Uh, Obrigado, Daniela. Vamos, então, vamos tocar aqui. Today I want to talk about artificial intelligence um, and I want to give you as much information as I can about what AI means, where it comes from, how it generates images and what the potential contribution it has to make for the future of architecture. We all use the term AI, but very few really know what it means. So today's uh, talk is uh, Architecture, the title is The Architecture in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. And I thought we're going to start by saying that I think we are an extraordinary moment um, in terms of the contributions that AI is making to architecture, a very exciting moment. I think that AI is going to radically transform architecture, um, and not only in terms of design, but also in terms of the kind of theoretical debates going on between the domain, let's say, of neuroscience and that of AI. So we live in the age of artificial intelligence. What I would say is, uh, in particular is that this year, 2022, is the year in which architects are finally waking up to the potential of AI. I say this for two reasons. Firstly, uh, this year there have been a series of diffusion platforms that have been launched, and these diffusion platforms are really changing and improving the way in which we can generate images on the left-hand side, the very first images, I understand it, generated through a GANs uh, network, a generative adversarial network. And then uh, on the right-hand side, um, uh, one of the recent uh, images that I produced uh, using Midjourney. And secondly, uh, this year, 2022, was the, has been the year in which the first ever mainstream books on AI, AI and architecture have been published in English. Um, uh, two of them, uh, I've been involved in two of them on the left -hand, top left-hand side, Architecture in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, an introduction to AI for architects, and I will draw upon some of the ideas in that book in my presentation today. And also on the bottom right, um, uh, an issue about architectural design, machine hallucinations, architecture and artificial intelligence, an issue of AD that I guest edited with Matias Del Campo. But all of these books have come out in 2022, which really marks the point at which uh, um, architects are beginning to engage substantively with the discourse of AI. So today's presentation, um, I want to break into four sections. First of all, uh, just outlining exactly what what a, what is AI exactly, um, and then looking at how it how it uh, what the origins of AI, how it evolved, uh, and then looking at how it generates images, the different techniques that have been used, and finally speculating on what might be the future impact of AI on the culture of architecture. So let's start with um, uh, artificial intelligence. What do we mean? by AI. Perhaps we could start then with the, um, the definition given by Margaret Bowden in her book, AI, Its Nature and, and Future. And she makes the comment, AI seeks to make computers do the sorts of things that minds can do. Well, is that correct? 
Firstly, I'd say that now, these days, AI can do many things much better than um, AI, than, than the human mind can, um, in particular domains. So, for example, in, let's say playing chess or Go, AI, AI is clearly superior to what humans can do. Uh, there are other domains, of course, where it's not so good, but it's 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 we, um, maybe this definition doesn't hold anymore. I'd also say that maybe um, computers don't necessarily need to do the things that human minds can do. There's a big debate about artificial about intelligence, about sorry, about consciousness and artificial intelligence. And I don't think that AI needs to be conscious. It doesn't need to be sentient. It doesn't need to be self aware. The big main main difference, in fact, between um, human intelligence and artificial artificial intelligence is the fact that AI is not conscious. Um, it uh, is unable to think, um, and uh, if it's unable to think, we have to question whether it, the term intelligence makes sense. Because um, if you can't think, how can you be intelligent, or how indeed can you learn? But we use the same terms, neural networks, to refer both to uh, the, the the mind itself, the brain itself, and also to deep learning, the recent development that is um, leading the way in AI. Um, so on the right-hand side here, we have um, neurons connected to other neurons through synapses, and the flow of information here, going from left to right, is governed by the weights on the synapses that control that information. Um, but this is loosely, only loosely inspired by the, the neurons and the synapses of the, the brain itself, so much so that some commentators, in particular, Melanie Mitchell, um, prefer not to use the word neuron. They, she uses the term um, unit instead. The general perception, if you were to ask most people what they, they, they think of when they think of AI, is that AI means a robot. Um, and examples such as this, Sophia the humanoid robot, um, come to mind. Um, but it's important to, to point out that AI doesn't mean a robot. A robot might be controlled by AI, just as a Tesla car is controlled by, by AI. But a robot is no more AI than a Tesla car is. Uh, the reason why perhaps we think this may be to do with the movies, um, where uh, movies such as Ex Machina, where we have obviously human actors playing the role of robots, um, whereas Sophia is a robot trying to pretend that it's um, human. Um, and this is a, it's a complete myth. And Sophia itself has been derided by the, um, the profession, by, by, the, by the AI community. Um, uh, Robbie Brooks uh, makes the comment that, that Sophia is completely bogus and a total sham. Benedict Anderson, uh, Benedict Evans goes uh, even further and, and likens Sophia to being little more than a tape recorder with a rubber head on it. Meanwhile, Yan Lekun, one of the one of the most important deep learning um, AI specialists, um, describes uh, Sophia as, as complete bullshit. And this is basically in the context of the, um, David Hansen, who who made the um, uh, developed uh, this robot, who had claimed that that Sophia was basically alive. Sophia is not alive. She is not. It is not aware of what it is, and you can't really engage in any meaningful conversation because Sophia cannot think. So if we're trying to think what, uh, to, trying to, to imagine what AI is, don't think humanoid robot, think algorithms. Because AI is essentially software. It is very advanced software, but it is software nonetheless. As such, it's essentially invisible. So the office of the future is not going to look like this. Um, we are not going to be uh, surrounded by humanoid robots, but we are going to be surrounded by AI. In fact, we already are. Most people are unaware of it, but our phones, for example, have many AI-powered apps. Uh, and AI is what filters out our, our spam and our, on our uh, emails. It's what finishes our sentence when we're using um, when we're using Gmail. Um, it's what spots our friends on Facebook. It's uh, and so on. It's it's been used on the phone the whole time, and it's in the house. It's what um, uh, 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 controls the Nest thermostat. It controls our AI-controlled uh, um, robotic uh, um, vacuum cleaners. Um, it's in Alexa and Siri, and so too it's in the car. It's, it's what's telling us when we're straying out of lane. It's what's uh, telling us the quickest route through Waze and other apps. And it's what, what allows us to order an Uber in the first place. In other words, we are surrounded by AI, but because it's, it's invisible, um, because we can't see it, most of us are unaware of this. In my book, I make the comment, um, it is as though the earth has been invaded 
by an, an invisible, superintelligent alien species. So how has AI evolved? Arguably the first person to conceptualize the possibility of AI was Alan Turing. Certainly in 1950, he published a paper uh, entitled Computing Machinery and Intelligence, whereby he connects computing with intelligence. But the term AI hadn't been coined at that stage, and it wasn't coined until 1956, when a, a, a gathering took place in Dartmouth College uh, in the States, um, where some of the, the smartest minds in, in, in academia came together to, to speculate about the possibility of what AI might be. And it was coined by John McCarthy, um, who had come across the term before somewhere, but he couldn't find where, it, where he'd found it. And, and he was never very happy with the term. Um, uh, but I had to call it something, as he put it. And indeed, I would say that there's nothing especially artificial about AI. I would say maybe synthetic intelligence might make sense. And maybe even the term intelligence might be called into question also. This happened then in, two, in, in 1956. And they they, they speculated they could possibly solve some of the basic problems about AI within the next two years. Well, the history of AI has been something of a roller coaster. It's been, um, in some ways, it's been uh, uh, boosted by the, a certain amount of hype, and it's often failed to live up to the hype. So it's been a kind of question of ups and downs. And one of the, the big challenges uh, has been for AI has been how to handle things like translation. Of course, it was established in this, they, they, the whole project was established during the Cold War in the States. And at that time, but one of the, the key obsessions was being able to translate Russian into English. And that's how they, one of the purposes they used AI for, first of all, but not with the greatest results. Um, what this, these are two examples that we used to joke about. I remember, I remember when I was a kid in the playground at school, we would joke about these things. Uh, they took the expression out of sight, out of mind, translated into, into Russian using AI and then back into English, and they got the expression an, an invisible lunatic. Or the, the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak comes out as the vodka is good, but the meat is rotten. And as a result of these kind of failures, um, we uh, AI went through a series of what are called AI winters when funding was withdrawn um, because AI was not living up to the hype. In fact, when it came to the 50th anniversary of that initial event, um, the survivors, as it were, got together um, back at Dartmouth. And you can see here Marvin Minsky here and John McCarthy, who coined the term. Um, uh, and and the, really, they had very little to show for 50 years of research. It was as though AI had really failed to live up to its potential. But by a curious coincidence, two of 2006 roughly marks the moment when um, AI uh, when deep learning began to take off, the deep learning revolution, which has really been so successful and which has really put AI on the map. The problem being, of course, that, that, that we still use the term AI when we're referring to deep, to deep learning, but the difference between the early days of AI and what we, what we have now is as radical as the difference between the, the first ever car and a Tesla self-driving car. They're both called car, but they are completely different. And what we can now do with AI is infinitely more sophisticated than we could do in the first days. So deep learning, the, the revolution that started around 2006 with the discovery that neural networks really could work, um, is itself part of machine learning, which has been around for, more, for longer, uh, which is itself part of, of AI itself. Think of these a little like uh, Russian dolls nested inside each other. But when we refer to AI these days, invariably, we are referring to deep learning. And what has led to this kind of revolution, um, this deep learning revolution? Well, there have been a number of, of, of factors that have, have enabled the possibility of, of deep learning. First of all, we have far greater computing power these days and much better algorithms. That makes a huge difference. Secondly, we now have um, cloud, um, cloud services whereby we, we can access GPUs remotely via the cloud. There is far greater competition now for AI and far greater investment in it. And of course, there are far more students studying AI, and that includes also architecture students studying AI. And finally, the, the amount of data being generated by social media is enormous. More than uh, uh, the last two years, more data has been generated than in the whole history of, of humankind. And the point is that deep learning depends upon data. Data is, as it were, the new oil. 
So all these factors together have allowed the possibility of this deep learning revolution that has completely changed things. If we were to point towards um, two events in history that show the impact of deep learning, we could perhaps refer to these. The, a moment in 19, 1997 when um, IBM's Deep Blue took on Gary Kasparov at chess, um, and uh, a moment in 2016 when Al, uh, DeepMind's AlphaGo took on Lisa Dole at Go. Ray Kurzweil had predicted that uh, by two, the year 2000, AI would be able to beat uh, the, uh, the best chess player in the world. But nobody really expected Gary Kasparov, one of the greatest um, chess players ever, to lose to AI, but lose he did. And uh, here we see him with his, his head in his hands uh, as he begins to, begins to realize that he has been beaten. And afterward, afterwards, he made this comment, we just have to understand that everything that we know how to do, machines will eventually do better than us. And he was absolutely right. Anything you can do, AI can do better. But the really important moment in many ways happened in 2016 when DeepMind's AlphaGo took on the world, uh, the, the leading, one of the leading um, uh, Go players in the world, Lisa Doll from Korea. And this required a different way to approach things because uh, chess is, is relatively straightforward compared to Go. There are more potential moves in Go than there are atoms on, on in the universe. So therefore, we had to find a different way of operating. Instead of the expert systems that were used in the match against Gary Kasparov, where basically uh, IBM's computer was, 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 was trained over all the known chess matches, um, with, with the match against, against Lisa Dull, um, uh, DeepMind had to use, it had to use uh, 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 deep learning um, rather than expert systems, deep learning to, um, to, 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 for, the, for the process. And what was astonishing about this particular match, which again, um, uh, everyone had expected Lisa Dole to win, was not so much the fact that it won, it was the manner in which it won. Um, Lisa Dole makes this comment after game two, yesterday I was surprised, but today I am speechless. And the reason why he makes that comment is largely because of a, of a series of moves that happened during the match referred to as slack moves that might appear originally to be glitches or mistakes by the computer program, but actually proved to be strategically brilliant moves um, whose, whose brilliance was not recognizable till many moves later. And in game two, there was one particular move that's now gone down in the history of AI, the history of Go, um, move 37, um, that was really quite remarkable. This is an unusual move early on in the game, and normally the third or the fourth uh, lines are chosen. This one, this, uh, um, AlphaGo chose the, the fifth line. And 100 moves later, the, the, these two black stones over here and this stone here linked up and won the game. It was as though AlphaGo had been able to think, well, you can't think, but to be able to predict uh, 100 moves ahead how uh, the game would pan out. And most people, when they saw this move, it was so unusual that they thought it was a mistake. So let me just play you a video um, by the commentators for the match. about uh, is this kind of, of evaluation, uh, uh, value. Uh. That's a very, that's Ooh. a very surprising move. I thought, I thought it was, I thought it was a mistake. But it was no mistake. And after the match, Lisa Dole came up with the comment, AlphaGo showed us, AlphaGo showed us that moves humans may have thought up creative were actually conventional. It was as though AlphaGo was able to operate at a level we just simply couldn't comprehend. Um, and we maybe could compare it to a way that a dog has a, a sense of smell or a sense of hearing that humans um, can't, can't engage with. We can't smell certain things, we can't, we can't uh, uh, hear certain things that dogs can. It's clear that in certain domains, AI is superior. This was, a, was, was this caused to, this proved to be a great wake up call, especially for the Go playing nations in the world, China, Japan, and Korea. And Kai Fu Li, um, in his book AI Superpowers, refers to this moment as the Sputnik moment. There were literally millions of people in China who were watching the match, and they were shocked by what happened. 
The reference to the Sputnik is, of course, a reference to um, the moment in 1957 when the Soviet Union um, uh, sent a satellite into space um, ahead of the Americans. The Sputnik, Sputnik was the name of the satellite, and it was a kind of wake-up call for America. Um, and as a result of that, uh, America formed NASA um, and, uh, and launched the Apollo missions and so on, and went to the moon and so on and so on. But it was because of this shock, this wake-up call, that they did that. And in terms of AI and, and China, uh, President Xi shortly after this match announced a huge investment in, into AI with a view of overtaking the states by the year 2030. But if AlphaGo was impressive, the next generation, AlphaGo Zero, was even more impressive. Not only did, not only did it beat AlphaGo 100 games to zero when it took it on at Go, but also it taught itself to play Go without being told the rules of Go through a process of reinforcement learning. Now that itself is astonishing, but what is almost more astonishing is the rate at which it taught itself to play Go. It played uh, 4.9 million games of Go against itself by, uh, over three days using reinforcement learning. Now, what exactly does that equate to? Well, if you think about it, uh, it it's, it's the equivalent of, of 20 games of Go per second. Now that is astonishing. This is a, um, a video of a hummingbird. Admittedly, it's a slowed up video of a hummingbird. But we can see in this video that the, the, the bird is beating its wings at roughly three beats per second. Now imagine something tw seven times faster than that. Imagine 20, 20 beats per second. That is the rate at which AI, at which uh, um, AlphaGo Zero could, put, could play against itself. That is simply truly astonishing. And most people, of course, can't even imagine that. Um, Jack Ma makes the comment in his dis debate with Elon Musk, I never in my life say human beings will be controlled by machines. It's impossible. Human beings can never create another thing that is smarter than human beings. And Musk responds, I very much disagree with that statement. The biggest mistake that I see people making is to assume they're smart. People underestimate the capability of AI. They sort of think it's like that, that it's like a, a smart human, but it's going to be than the smartest human you will ever know. So how exactly does AI generate images? I want to just take you through um, the, the, the shift, as it were, from GANs, from generative adversarial networks, to the use of these diffusion platforms. But let me start earlier on. Um, this is a comment made by Makoto Se Watanabe um, that we included in our book published in 2017. Machines are better than people at solving complex problems with many intertwined conditions. In that realm, people are no match for machines, but people are the only ones who can create an image that does not yet exist. Machines do not have dreams. In 2012, shortly after the beginning of the deep learning revolution, um, Jeffrey Hinton and his team um, entered uh, an ImageNet competition where they won. They were able to, um, in, to, to recognize uh, images faster than any other system. What happens with um, this process is basically uh, you take an image of, let's say, a bird, and then the pixels are then fed through these layers one after the other. And often the hidden layers can be up to, they can be up to a, a thousand layers. Um, and, and eventually it will recognize it as a bird. It will never be fully convinced. You'll never get 100%, but it will say 99%. It's 99% sure, 99 sure that it's a bird. Well, that was a, re a remarkable breakthrough, but the holy grail within computing, computer, science, with computer science was to operate the other way, to, as it were, synthesize an image, to hallucinate an image, to use AI to generate an image. And what they soon discovered, a number of researchers, including Alex Malvinsev of Google, they discovered that you could take this process, instead of going from left to right, you can go from right to left, and it would generate images. So in other words, you would invert the, in the network and, and make it operate in the different, in the opposite direction, which is kind of interesting from, from a kind of theoretical perspective, because it begins to suggest that the process of interpretation or criticism or theory, shall we say, it operates in the opposite direction to the process of generation of design of creation, which might explain why so few architects are both designers and also theorists. They seem to operate in the opposite way. The first outcomes of this were, became known as Deep Dream. 
Um, and this is one example. You can see that this particular network has been trained on uh, what looks like dogs and serpents or, or snakes or something, and for some reason, an oil lamp. And then what it does effectively is then read these into everything that it sees. But the problem here that it is that it's pose invariant. In other words, the image is all, all over the screen. Um, and that's because information on where they are to be positioned has been lost in the process. The big breakthrough happen, uh, happened with the invention of generative adversarial networks um, referred that were invented by Ian Goodfellow. And the way these operate is that they have two um, uh, they have two neural networks, as it were, competing against each other. Generative adversarial networks. You have a generator here, and you have a discriminator. And what the generator does is that by taking ran it takes random noise and it generates images that the discriminator then judges. If it's convinced that they're 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 real images, it can be accepted. If not, it's it's, it's rejected as fake. And it's comparing these images against a data set. Now, over time, the generator then is forced to improve its act, it's forced to learn. And so what happens basically is the discriminator is training the generator, but the generator is, is also training the discriminator. We can think of this again, the generator being the designer, the discriminator being the critic. So you, in many ways, you have to have both. You have to have the, 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 the generator improves through criticism, but also the critic gets to learn about creativity by being the discriminator. Anyway, as a result of this, um, there are a number of, of, of GAN systems developed. There's, and, and style GANs emerged out of progressive GANs. And this is an example of what it could do. It can hallucinate faces of people who do not exist. In other words, it is challenging Makoto's, um, uh, Makoto Se Watanabe's uh, claim that computers can't generate anything that doesn't exist. It can. In fact, you can go to a website called This Person Does Not Exist. And every time you refresh your browser, you will uh, you will generate a really remarkably convincing image, an image of someone who doesn't exist, a fake image, as it were, but entirely convincing. And it wasn't long before architects began to realize that they too could do something like this. This is the work of Wang Yu He of X Cool, um, one of the DDES candidates at Florida International University, who is who is a CEO of a company, one of the leading companies in the world, developing um, software for architects. X Cool. Uh, it, she used to work for uh, for um, Graham Coolhouse, and X Cool means X Coolhouse. So what you get is something that is really quite surprising. Um, but this is just a two dimensional image. It might look three three dimensional, but it's only two dimensional. The world of media art woke up the possibility of AI, I would say one year um, before architects started playing around with it. In 2018, uh, the first ever AI generated painting had been auctioned off at a, ma at a major um, uh, uh, auction house. Uh, the, the work Edmond de Bollamé by the Paris Collective, obvious, created quite a sensation at the time. And in 2018, the first ever painting generated by AI won an international art prize when Mario Klingman's The Butcher's Son was awarded the Lumen Prize. And so too in 2018, Blazer Bury Arcus established, um, who established a, a, a Google Artists and Machine Intelligence group, um, uh, hosted the first ever, curated the first ever <clears throat> exhibition on AI generated art, largely deep dream art. But also in 2018, <clears throat> uh, the media artist uh, Refik Anadol, um, uh, with, with advice, with help of, of Google AMI, um, uh, produced this, um, a commission for, to mark the 100th anniversary for the Los Angeles Philharmonic or um, uh, 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 Orchestra. And he projected onto Frank Gehry's um, iconic um, Walt Disney Concert Hall um, this astonishing um, projection. In fact, the moment in October 2018, when they switched on these 40 or so uh, projectors onto this building and illuminated it, this in some ways symbolically was the moment when AI met architecture. Now, to be clear, Refi Anadol is not an architect, he's a media artist, but he uses buildings both as his data and also as his canvas. It wasn't until 2019, though, the first um, AI-generated design for architecture had been achieved. And this was Refik Anadol again, picking up on the, the techniques that he'd learned, especially the use of style GANs, 
And he, he performed this exercise, which is based on the data set of the work of, of Zahadid architects, where effectively what he does is upload thousands upon thousands of images um, onto the computer and then uses style GANs to, as it were, hallucinate another possible design by Zaha. And then you'll see from this that um, the, they must have used a lot of images taken of the, uh, the, the Zaha the Architects um, uh, uh, project in Beijing, Soho project in Beijing. Now, this is a very slow and laborious process. It takes some time. It's very time consuming. It requires a lot of effort. You literally have to load thousands upon thousands of images up in order to get anything um, out. And what you get out is maybe not that convincing. But what is interesting, though, is that it can eventually produce something that looks like it's a design by Zaha Hadid. And indeed, you know, we're now that we've moved on and developed even more effective techniques, we can see that this is really the beginning of something very, very special. So the point is this, even though Zaha Hadid is no longer alive, Nonetheless, we can take all the, the, the take all the work that has been um, undertaken by by the office and generate another another building that could have been designed by Zahadi. In other words, um, it, they, we use existing data to generate something kind of similar, and this operates through a process of interpolation. In other words, there is a finite amount of data, and whatever comes out must be the result of must come out of that particular data it can only operate within that particular set and after a certain a, a certain moment what we can see coming out of this is something that looks really quite like a design by Zahadi, just emerging as it were out of the computer hallucinated or synthesized as the terms are so in a second then we will see precisely that an image that wasn't designed by zaha but nonetheless itself could well be have been designed by Zaha. And there it is. We use this image on the front cover of, of my book, Architecture in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, an introduction to AI for Architects. And it was very, very significant. I, I believe that it was the first ever architectural design hallucinated using style gans. And since then, things have moved on. From 2019 to 2021, uh, many architects, or well, not many, but a group of architects were exploring the use of gans. And this is uh, what's known as Deep Himmelblau, a project that was um, uh, undertaken by the office of Corp Himmelblau in Vienna, led by Wolf Briggs, and, and masterminded by the, the, um, the AI architectural genius, um, uh, uh, Daniel Bolojan, who was responsible for this. This is actually using not just style GANs, but also cycle GANs and a variety of other techniques. And what it's effectively doing is hallucinating other possible designs by the office. And this is this was certainly the state of the art in 2021. It won a Digital Futures Award, and Wolf, Wolf Crick's also won an Academy Award for his uh, lifetime contribution to architecture. So this is really what we had in 2021, and some of the still images look actually remarkably convincing. There are a few glitches, but with deep learn with deep learning, these things improve over time, and you can gradually and gradually improve them. And it's not bad. Uh, at least it was the state of the art that we had in 2021, and it was it was good enough to find itself on the front cover of our book of our AD issue of AD Machine Hallucinations. This is actually that very same project. Um, but then something else was happening, something truly extraordinary. Um, OpenAI, a company based in Silicon Valley that was initially um, supported by Elon Musk and others was developing a huge uh, natural language processing system. Um, uh, and GPT-3 came out, uh, uh, came out uh, shortly later, uh, the third version of this, and it was astonishing what it could do. It, could, it, could, it was a pre-trained model. In other words, millions, literally millions and millions of images were uploaded, and uh, it was used uh, as a kind of, uh, to, 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 to generate text. Um, so uh, it was based on, on everything you could find on the internet. So it produced, it produced often some very convincing text, but then they began to realize that you could connect this text to images um, um, because through the logic of the caption. So you find on the internet plenty of references that have an image connected with a text by way of a, of a caption. And the first attempt at this was known as DALI, um, where they were able to, um, to generate um, some really quite remarkable outcomes, such as this, an avocado armchair, where effectively what it's doing, um, what DALI is doing is, is searching and synthesizing. 
It is searching particular kind of images and, and bringing them together in a certain way. So, in fact, many of these are, are really quite convincing. And, and this was probably the most uh, in, most successful outcome of this initial um, um, uh, initial uh, 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 Dali model. And and as a result of that, um, people started playing around with this. Now, Dali was not open source, but um, OpenAI open did pr did produce Click that was open source and. Uh, a, a group of individuals started playing around with Click and using it in conjunction with VQ GANs to, to generate a way of designing based on prompts, based on text. So this is the work of Giovanna Piaka, who is now a professor in, uh, in Peru, but at the time she was a student uh, doing this on a Digital Futures um, uh, workshop uh, in the summer of 2021. The, the two prompts that she used, the first was a kind of pre-prompt where she mentions the names of, of three architects, Yan Sung Ma, Tom Main, and Wolf Pricks. And then she, uh, uh, she uses a, a main prompt, um, which was futuristic Indian temple. And what comes out is remarkable. I know several people who've been on this workshop and they were all blown away by the possibility of what you could achieve. But what is so important about this kind of intermediary model is that the people who produced it, the people who, who engineered this way of working, were the very same people who started working on Midjourney. In other words, this was the kind of predecessor of Midjourney itself. Uh, in 2022, in the, the, the first uh, in the spring, um, Dali 2 was released to a few um, experts within the system. Um, and that caused even more of a sensation. It wasn't released to the public until um, not much later on, but it caused a sensation because it was able to take this search and synthesis to a new level. So for example, this image here where the caption, where the caption is, is an astronaut and a horse, um, it was able to put together something that probably never happened. We probably never had an astronaut riding a horse and we probably never had a photograph of it. But anyway, it was able to produce an image of what would have, what it would look like if an astronaut were to ride a horse, something remarkable. And there are many other examples um, that cause something of a sensation. A cat dressed as fr the French Emperor Napoleon holding a piece of cheese. Well, the text at the top, it looks like it's gobbledygook, but this does look like a convincing um, cat dressed as the, uh, the French Emperor Napoleon holding a piece of cheese. And likewise, this um, image, which is supposed to kind of recreate uh, an oil painting of a, a teenager texting her boyfriend, beautiful lighting, Caravaggio 1580. Well, in 1580, they didn't have cell phones. You weren't able to text. But nonetheless, um, what Dali 2 is able to do is imagine what it would have looked like had this happened. So this was an enormous breakthrough. In, uh, uh, in May 2022, I gave a lecture at the Architectural Association in London to the Design of the Research Laboratory, and Patrick Schumacher was in the audience, and I was speculating about when the Sputnik moment would be for architecture, when architects would eventually wake up to the possibility of AI. And Patrick said, well, it's already here. And uh, although I didn't know about it, um, uh, uh, Zaha Hadid architects had been working with Refik Anadol on the potential use of DALI 2 for architecture. And Anadol, because he was well known within the AI community, had been given access to DALI 2 before it was made publicly available. And some of these images are really a huge improvement on that very first image that I showed you that was generated using style gains. We can see a, re a kind of something very realistic. It looks at those three dimensions, but it's only two dimensions, but it's something which really takes things to a new level. Um, and this really was the beginning of, as it were, the wake up call for architects. This was how the office itself was able to um, take the previous work of the office and imagine other forms of, of expression that come out of the office. But so too, other people who weren't working in the office could take the work, could take the work of Zahidi architects and also hallucinate images. I mean, bearing in mind that Zaha is a very famous architect, there are plenty of images on the internet with captions to them. Zaha is a particularly easy architect to use. If you take someone more obscure, you won't get the same results. But this, for example, is what happens when you, um, you, you ask for a hotel room in the style of Zaha Hadid, and you get something pretty convincing. This looks like it's a, 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 a bed designed by Zaha Hadid. On the walls, you get these two images, which are weren't in the prompt, but then are generated anyway by the system. And you get some lighting in the ceiling and some really quite convincing um, uh, reflections on the marble floor. And, and so it goes on. You can actually very quickly and much quickly, more quickly than using GANs, 
can generate these things. The diffusion models operate in a very different way. They're not based on GANs. They're based on, uh, on, uh, on, a, on a diffusion network which uses a Markov chain to create Gaussian noise. That Gaussian noise disrupts an image. In the process of, of being repairing the image, a new image is, is created. So this new technique, which is much, much quicker than GANs, has really revolutionized the, the, um, the production of images um, for the use of AI. And it doesn't have to be a hotel room. We can do any form of, of room and, 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 and use the same prompt. We now, as architects, become prompt engineers, and it's, it becomes very crucial to get the prompt right in order to get the, the, the best outcomes. But it doesn't have to be progressive uh, organic architecture, freeform architecture. It can also be modernist rectilinear architecture. I did this series um, uh, based on a prompt, uh, a minimalist villa in the Swiss Alps. And what comes out again is, is remarkably convincing. The, the, um, the mountains in the background um, look really quite convincing. And you can see the kind of reflection that's appearing in the water here that again looks very convincing. Now, we should know that mid-journey, is, this is only a two-dimensional image, and mid-journey doesn't know the three-dimensional definition of what it's looking at here, and therefore it can't calculate the exact um, uh, reflection. But nonetheless, something plausible comes out, and it is remarkable what it can achieve. So everybody, when they've used, been using mid-journey, have been, have been shocked by it, by, it, by the kind of, it's a wake-up call. And it, it looks like it's going to be a game-changer in architecture. So this is a, a series on the office of the future, where you get some very crisp and very precise images coming out. Although when you look closely, you notice that, for example, these what appear to be chairs have no legs and this table has no leg. And you begin to realize that actually what's happening often is that the mind is filling in and providing information, interpreting the, uh, the, the, the image so as to make sense of it, even though it doesn't make complete sense. Again, this um, office of the future here, this chair has really no legs. I mean, we're not quite sure where the edge of the, of the office is, but nonetheless, something comes out that, we're, is, that is understandable. I've also used it for, um, to design, to look at furniture, to generate images of furniture. And what I do with all my, my, um, my props these days is to include something in the prompt that, as it were, generates something unusual. Think of it a bit like the grain of sand in an oyster that produces the pearl. So for this particular series, I included the reference to a certain, um, uh, a certain uh, frog, a uh, poisonous frog from the Amazon. And what it begins to do is introduce a whole series of colors into, the, into, the, uh, into the, what is generated that is really quite convincing. And the forms are quite convincing. The shading is quite convincing. You also have to mention, of course, that the, you, 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 that uh, you want to make it hyper-realistic. You have to mention a rendering engine and so on. But what comes out is actually can be actually very, very convincing um, and quite surprising. Things that you wouldn't have imagined yourself. So this becomes a kind of like a prosthesis to the imagination, allowing us to imagine possibilities that we wouldn't have imagined on our own. And But on certain moments, the, you, you sometimes find that the, the frog itself or whatever it is you put into the prompt appears in the prompt. So this is another version of um, the furniture. This was using the term shark um, as the kind of the, the grit in the oyster. And it produces something with a remarkable texture, presumably a reference to the, the texture of a shark skin or something like that. And again, producing results that are kind of inspirational, surprising, shocking, something that we never would have imagined ourselves. And what I also find remarkable about uh, about uh, mid journey um, is that I mean AI is 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 completely immaterial. Um, it's just algorithms. So how is it capable of rendering so um, Im impressively or, or producing representations of material objects like this, uh, such as these pebbles that really look incredibly realistic? And in a, in a series of other studies I've done, where I, in this case, I was kind of uh, uh, breeding or, or um, uh, taking the work of Zahadid and crossing it with, with um, a, um, a white orchid, you can get this kind of curious hybrid entity coming out. Is this uh, uh, an orchid designed by Zaha, or is this uh, a bit of furniture that uh, of Zaha furniture that is inspired by orchids? What comes out is 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 truly remarkable. And it's extrapolating. It's it's opening up the possibilities. Whereas style gans was only internally operating internally and therefore interpolating. This can actually, can breed things that we couldn't have imagined ourselves. And again, incredibly convincing with a strong sense of materiality, with incredible shading and so on. This seems to me to be a real sort of game changer as far as conceptual design itself is concerned. 
And there are many in this series that came out that, uh, that, that really are very, very careful, very precise. You can't control it. You can't control it. All you can do is maybe coax it in a certain area by selecting certain images over others. And that reminds me in some way of what we do when we're teaching in a studio. You can't control a student, but you can maybe encourage that student to go in one direction or another, and then we can see what happens. What is interesting also when you take this process, and what I often do when I breed it with something else, I often go for the image that looks least like architecture and allow it to emerge and develop over time. So this was a study called Architectures of the Sunset, where for some reason we get this kind of sand dune-like landscape appearing, which begins out of which certain forms start to begin to emerge that look like some kind of proto-architecture in the background. We can see some rocks. Um, and as we, over time, we, we, we discover the rocks start turning into something more like uh, a city and, and something that is a, a getting close to architecture is beginning to emerge out of the so-called sand dunes. Um, and over time, it becomes more and more like a building and sometimes producing things that we absolutely wouldn't have conceived ourselves. This image, I think, is one of the most creative that I've produced using Midjourney, and so on. So as we, as we go through these steps, we begin to get more and more refined, more and more details, fenestration starts appearing on these images, and it's, they start turning into, they're located down in the city itself, they start turning into something that is far more convincing as a building until eventually we end up with things that really um, could well have been built. That was one study I did with the sunset and, 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 and buildings and the, the designs in the style of Zaha Hadid. And, and this is another uh, cousin, shall we say, in that particular series where they branch out and they take different, um, different, different uh, characteristics. And this particular branch is not so obviously different colors. And this is producing something that really looks remarkably like some kind of art museum or art gallery in the city. It is very, very sophisticated and really quite convincing. All of a sudden, Mid Journey is opening up new possibilities to us. This is another study which is um, taking a thundercloud and, and, and crossbreeding thunderclouds with the work of Zahedid. Is this a thundercloud designed by Zaha Hadid? As it gradually moves forward and it starts developing, we can notice that sort of architectural forms begin to emerge. This is kind of almost like a proto building. And, and eventually we begin to work our way through until we, stu we do find ourselves with something that we could maybe describe here, an interior of a building that gradually gets more and more sophisticated over time. And, and on the outside too, um, quite precise and quite refined um, um, buildings that you can you can understand the doors and the fenestration and so on, um, and, 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 and remarkable, remarkable things that we would never have imagined are coming out of the computer system um, using Mid Journey. As the, this is why I, I talk about this as some kind of prosthesis to the human imagination. We can use these tools to, as it were, extend our creative capabilities and generate designs we otherwise would never have thought about. Um, another uh, project I did, a similar one, was, called, was based on the Aurora Borealis, where we take the Aurora Borealis and begin to sort of crossbreed it with the work of Zaha Hadid. And once more, we get these kind of very abstract forms beginning to emerge that over time begin to sort of crystallize, as it were, to, to become, to emerge as something that is um, appearing to, to looking very much like architecture. And so we go on. This is the interior of the space itself, um, the oculus, as it were, um, and, and a view of the outside. And then we come to probably one of the most astonishing um, images that I've generated, a design that really could have come out of the office of Zahedid Architects, uh, designs of architectures of the Aurora Borealis was a name that I gave to this particular series. And I also did a second version of this, um, tracing out another uh, family tree, as it were, another kind of, uh, 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 maybe these are cousins to that original one where I'm exploring in particular the interior of a space, or at least it's taking, it's, 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 it's showing, show, generating these images that appear to be uh, something like interiors. And once more, it's producing things that really, and it gradually evolves over time until you eventually find yourself with something that is truly astonishing. This image is another one of the, one of the most successful images that I've ever generated using Mid Journey, and, and quite astonishing. Um, I would never have imagined this myself, and yet it is being produced by this simple tool. 
So and it doesn't happen to be necessarily to be very contemporary architecture. You can also do more traditional architecture. This is um, uh, a Persian interior that was generated um, uh, using Mid Journey um, and, and caused something of a sensation on Instagram where, where people started, uh, Iranians started being wake up called the, the intricacy of the detail of these of these um, these generated images is really quite astonishing. And you can also use it for arabesque architecture. This was a study that I did that um, produced also remarkable um, results, very kind of filigree results, very delicate, very intricate, very detailed in some ways, and also very inspirational. So um, out of this, then we can we can look at both the both the, the organic, the rectilinear. We can look at the contemporary, we can look at the historical. These tools can be applied in many different sort of ways. Although it seems that most of the time it's been they're being deployed. To generate something that is novel, that is that is unusual, that is very progressive, and so on. So let me finish off with the final question: What is the future of AI? And um, and we've already seen how we can sort of shift from 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 GANs to um, something uh, really quite remarkable using stable diffusion. Now that I would claim is but the tip of the iceberg. The important thing about being able about generating these these images is that somehow it allows architects to recognize, to realize the potential of AI. You can write as many books as you want, but unless you've got images that are convincing, architects are not going to pay attention to them. But with these images, we now at last begin to realize exactly what AI is capable of. And this is really opening up a new chapter. But I would claim that this is just but the beginning of something else in the sense that within three to five years, we can predict that AI is going to be doing something truly astonishing. And I say this because I know the people who are working on the AI software that will be available and on, on online in, in, in three to five years time. And what it will be able to produce is a different way of working altogether. So at the moment, if you work for Zaha, you might do an initial sketch on Maya, then you then produce something based on Rhino, then you do a BIM model of it and so on. And what would happen, what would happen in the future, it'll be a seamless single platform that goes from data to fabrication. And what's more, it'll have written into it all the kind of performance requirements that you need, all the kind of structural performance, the acoustic performance, the environmental performance, and the a cost analysis, and indeed all the all the other requirements, such as the local um, the, the the codes, the building regulations, and so on. So what is will be produced will automatically be conforming to all those requirements, and that will be truly astonishing. But think of that like the, 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 what we can see now is the tip on the iceberg. We're getting a glimpse of something. This is just a sketching tool mid-journey, but what can happen very soon is something can generate a performing building itself. And maybe I could on this, uh, I could maybe quote uh, Alan Turing on this. This is only a foretaste of what is to come and a shadow of what is to be. And I think we could say this exactly about mid-journey and what's going to happen in the next three to five years. So there are actually two models that we can take and think about the potential future of architecture. On the left-hand side, the model of AlphaGo, and the right-hand side, the Tesla car. And what we find out from, Alpha, from, from AlphaGo is that actually AI is already able to do something surprising, a little like Move 37 in Game 2. This is a project in Norway that was generated using SpaceMaker AI. It doesn't look so special. It looks fairly conventional, very polite in some senses. But the techniques used were really truly quite revolutionary. And so what happens on occasions is that it can produce things that we wouldn't have imagined, just like Move 37. These are the comments of Harvard Hochland, who points out that even though there are many architects in the room who had a lot of experience, none of them would have come out with that particular suggestion, and yet it was one that was possibly the most appropriate. In other words, the computer is able to operate at a different level to what we can, to open up possibilities of different designs that we couldn't imagine. And there were many cases also where they began to realize that it would be able to produce a much more efficient um, solution. And as a result of all this, one thing that, that Hopeland noticed and comments on is the fact that developers are asking their architects to use SpaceMaker AI. There's a requirement from their clients. So why are they asking their architects to, to use SpaceMaker AI? Well, there's on one obvious reason. They want to guarantee the return on their investment, their ROI, as it, as it, as it were. 
So what they're doing then is using this to guarantee that, to check things, to maximize, to make sure they're making the, the most profit possible. Their building is performing as well as possible. They're getting the maximum out of the plot of, plot of land that they're developing. And this seems to be possibly the most important discovery that I came up with my research, the idea that we would need to use AI. What happened to, to Lisa Dole? Well, in 2019, uh, he gave up the game of Go. He made the comment, this is an entity that cannot be defeated. And is that a presage for architects? Are we going to face the same feat? So the other model then is the one of the self-driving car. And we can all already see the potential, for example, of, of using an Uber as a self-driving car. After all, we, when we order an Uber, we already input the destination. We've already told Uber where we want to go. So what is the role of the driver? If the, the car could be a self-driving car, then you know, we can maybe have a nice chat with the driver, but we don't need a driver because we've already told uh, the, the Uber where to go. And uh, Toby Walsh comes up with really quite a striking, quite shocking comment on the, on the, on the self-driving car. And he makes the prediction that eventually we'll be banned from driving. We won't be allowed to drive cars anymore and we will no, not, not notice or even care. So what does he mean by that? What he's suggesting is that, 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 is that, that it'll be convenient to start using self-driving cars. We're going out for a drink in the evening, we don't drive home, we can maybe use a self-driving car. And gradually, as a result of that, we will start losing some of our driving skills. Moreover, self-driving cars are, are going to become increasingly reliable. They're going to become more reliable than human beings to the point that we will have to have to pay extra insurance to be driving um, on our own without using a self-driving car. And eventually we'll think, ah, what the hell? And the important point that he makes is that we will not even notice or care. Often these changes are a bit like in the, the story of boiling a frog. They happen very, very gradually and you don't notice it. If, the, if you want to boil a frog, they say, don't drop the frog into a pan of boiling water, put the frog in some tepid water and gradually raise the heat and the frog won't even notice. Put this against a culture of amnesia and you find yourself in a different domain entirely. We, if we look back, for example, uh, uh, there was a, a moment when we used to use fax machines, a moment before we had laptops, before we had Wi-Fi, before we even had the internet really, um, and it seems to us almost impossible, too far back in history, but there was a time, and it wasn't that long ago when we were like this. So the question we have to ask ourselves, is this going to happen to the domain of architecture? What was likely to happen, in other words, is AI is going to be able to check things and make sure things are absolutely correct. Um, uh, we're going to use it initially a bit like that, like a spell check and things. But eventually, it could well be that if we don't use it, we, the professional indemnity insurance will go up. So we basically have to use it. And once we use it, then it can effectively be able to eventually be able to design buildings all on its own. And will we be in the same situation? Will we be saying we won't be allowed to design buildings anymore and we will not notice or care? Game over. In other words, there is a dark side to AI, not that it's, it's, it's in itself evil or there's anything inherently wrong with it. It's just incredibly capable and it's beginning to show us up already. So here is, I want to finish off with a series of predictions that I made about the future of AI um, that I revised for the Chinese translation of my book because things have happened much more quickly than I even I had imagined. Um, first of all, AI will become part of the curriculum in every school of architecture. I agree that is already the case already. We have many AI apps we use and now it seems that you, you don't even need to be taught this. So many students now are using Midjourney and DALI to generate designs. The next comment obviously holds true. It is true, for example, for the cell phone. It's much easier to use cell phones these days. The more advanced technology it becomes, the easier it is to use. We have swiping, we have kind of facial recognition on our phone, and the same goes for AI. It is much easier to use mid-journey than it was to use GANs. Architects will use AI for inspiration, inspiration and become experts in writing good prompts for AI. This is an important thing. We all have to become good, prompt engineers in order to write the, the, the best description to get the best results. All buildings will become intelligent. Well, that itself is, is fairly self-evident. And cities will be controlled by AI. Already in China, they're finding that there are companies like, um, like, like uh, Brain, uh, City Brain are able to um, control traffic in cities um, by using a digital twin. In other words, by using real-time feedback from the actual city 
they are using the, using the computational power of AI to solve problems like traffic congestion and so on. That jams, traffic jams in the future should hopefully disappear. Facial recognition will mean that we no longer need passports, keys, credit cards, or cash. Already in China, you can pay for things with using facial recognition. And here in the States, I last entered the States in the UK without my passport, just simply through facial recognition. Initial response to AI will fade as AI becomes indispensable, an indispensable invisible assistant for architects. This just simply echoes what happened um, back in the 90s when, when, when computation was first introduced into architecture. You either had to engage with it or you became effectively obsolete. Clients will also insist on their architects using AI. That's based on the comment from Howard Hochland. The entire building process will become seamless and automated, incorporating all codes, costs, and performance requirements. That, of course, I've also already mentioned, it is going to happen because the software being, that, that's going to be allowed to happen is currently under development and will be available in the next three to five years. And finally, AI will be able to generate detailed architectural designs completely autonomously. And I say that because right now we have to work, we, it's, it becomes a prosthesis to us. We are working with AI, but in the future, AI will be able to do it on its own. After all, AI already knows what our tastes are in terms of music through Spotify, what are what the books we like through Amazon and the news we like. There are already bots that are kind of feeding us what we like already. And very soon it will be able to understand what kind of architecture we like. In other words, it will be able to customize a design and produce it completely autonomous, but that itself becomes a threat to us as architects. It's not that AI is evil, rather it is simply incredibly capable. AI is both uh, astonishing, but also terrifying. It is astonishing, terrifying. So let me finish up with my uh, just my, my Instagram um, uh, account and also the Digital Futures World Instagram account where you'll find a number of events being promoted, a number of, of, of designs being uploaded. And I also want to refer to the Digital Futures platform itself, where there are many uh, tutorials um, and, and, and sessions where we discuss, discuss AI, and they can all be found at the bottom here on the, the YouTube library where we have collated everything and made everything available for free. It's important, I think, for architects to, to, today to really recognize the potential um, contribution of AI. It can be a very positive contribution, but it also can be a very negative one if we are not alert to it. We shouldn't be ostriches that, with our heads buried in the sand. We should be aware of the problem. To my mind, the important thing to design right now as architects is not another building, but rather the future of architecture itself. Thank you. Olá, obrigado a todos. Uh, Angélica, se quiser terminar de compartilhar a tela, acho que a gente pode ir encaminhando para o debate agora. Uh, primeiro de tudo, gostaria de agradecer ao Neil Leach pela palestra e pela presença. So, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Neil Leach, for your presence here today. Uh, is there anything you want to, you would like to share with us before the we open for the debate? Então, você gostaria de falar alguma coisa antes da gente iniciar o debate? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Ricardo. I, I would simply say that um, we are seeing history in the making, and things are changing rapidly. Since I submitted that video, uh, there are better things that have appeared. It, it's uh, it's almost out of date. And that's the challenge. Things are changing so quickly. All right. Uh, então ele ele disse que as coisas simplesmente a gente está tá vendo a história sendo feita e as coisas estão mudando muito rapidamente e acaba que a própria palestra acaba estando um pouco desatualizada por causa dessa velocidade do desenvolvimento. Uh, mas então eu gostaria de iniciar. É, gostaria de convidar a Marina. Uh, você gostaria de fazer algum comentário, Marina? Uh, Sim, boa tarde. É, né, eu vou pedir que vocês puderem desbloquear meu vídeo. Oh, sorry. Obrigada. É, bem, pessoal, obrigada a todos. É, eu gostaria, sim, eu queria agradecer o convite. Uh, hi, Neil, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here to discuss this very interesting and very exciting subject. Uh, it's amazing uh, to discuss that. 
So uh, I'm going to do the, the question in Portuguese and after uh, I can translate it or the organization can, can do it, okay? Um, so, um, bem, é, para mim, né, o que parece mais interessante nesse assunto é essa possibilidade da máquina ser capaz de operar num padrão que os humanos não são capazes de compreender. Né? Então, o que a gente viu, acho que nos últimos meses, foi essa possibilidade da, da inteligência artificial gerar essas imagens que possibilitam essa combinação, customização em massa, né, de estilos arquitetônicos, o que acaba gerando essa infinidade de possibilidades estéticas. Bem, o que a gente vê nessa fase né, me parece um pouco uma abordagem ainda bastante estilística, né, uma espécie aí de ultramodernidade, mas ainda muito calcada nessa ideia do estilo e da estética. O que me lembra um pouco é o que o Bing Chul Han ele fala no livro, né, ele é um filósofo coreano, e ele fala no livro A Salvação do Belo, essa questão da geração das imagens digitais, né? então que tem uma ideia de uma temporalidade no belo digital, né? sendo um presente imediato sem futuro, mas também sem história. Bem, então nisso, né, o belo digital, ele traz um pouco uma ideia de diversidade, mas não de alteridade, né? então é uma ideia que ele acaba, ela acaba não tendo a ideia da negatividade, né, nem, e nem um tipo de rasgo, ele é liso, né, nesse sentido. Então, o espaço liso, ele não tem estranheza, ele não tem alteridade. Bem, então, nisso, né, o próprio Bruno Churran, ele fala que essa salvação, ela poderia é, estar numa ideia de vinculação, né, então, a ideia da fidelidade, da duração, da persistência, que o próprio Neil disse, né, que esse futuro da inteligência artificial estaria ligado à ideia de performance, né, então, essa ideia de gerar edifícios performáticos traria a gente uma ideia da tectônica e a tectônica traria né, a ideia da gente pensar a arquitetura como um projeto construção e uso. Bem, então aí eu remontei, remonto um pouco a ideia que o Negroponte ele coloca na década de 60 sobre essa, né, o que era na, no paradigma da época é, uma discussão da incapacidade da máquina de compreender contextos socioculturais, né, o que o próprio Gordon Pass, que na hora que a gente fala um pouco da teoria da conversação, da cibernética de segunda ordem, que essa necessidade de interações, elas não só, são só dialógicas, mas também dialéticas, né? e que a, a máquina, ela, seria, ela poderia seguir o método de um arquiteto, mas ela seria incapaz de discernir e assimilar idiocracidades conversacionais pela sua relação com o contexto, né? ou seja, tempo, localidade e cultura. Bem, então, nesse sentido, né, se a gente pensar do ponto de vista metodológico, da, da ideia da conversação da cibernética, eu queria perguntar para o Nil como que ele acha que isso poderia ser possível, né? essas trocas não só dialéticas, mas também, não só dialógicas, desculpa, mas também dialéticas no processo de projeto, com os outros profissionais, né? como, por exemplo, eu acho que o, o próprio engenheiro de estrutura, o, 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 a pessoa que vai, né? o coordenador da obra. Então, a minha pergunta seria nesse sentido, né? como podemos ter um, um deep learning, de repente, que possa compreender a ideia de contexto e possa realizar trocas dialéticas no âmbito do processo de projeto? Bem, acho que seria isso. Uh, Marina, você conseguia, você conseguiria reformular para a gente um pouco mais curtamente, talvez em inglês para para ele? Yes, yes. Uh, well, uh, Neil, I'm uh, I'm basing my argument in the second order cybernetics, and uh, I wanna ask you uh, how we can uh, consider the context and the, the dialectical chains uh, between the other professionals to include a cultural context and uh, in a dialogical change, you know? <laughs> wow, uh, that's a big question. Um, uh, may, maybe could you ask one particular, make it more specific, because uh, as soon as you introduce second order of cybernetics, it's a big question. Could you maybe make the question more precise? Yeah, uh, just a second. 
pelo que eu entendi da pergunta, ela quer saber como que o Deep Learning, a inteligência artificial, vai integrar essa conversa entre o arquiteto, o engenheiro, as outras pessoas envolvidas na, na, na construção, é, e também como que ela entende essa questão cultural das pessoas. Né? Eu acho que é mais ou menos isso, certo, Marina? Sim, yes? exato. So, uh, she would like to know a little bit more how deep learning is going to integrate this conversation between architects, engineers, and other professionals that are involved in the construction industry. So, if artificial intelligence is going to improve something in this context. And the other thing she mentions is about uh, how artificial intelligence understands Uh, cultures and the other aspects that are uh, inherent from uh, the human? Well, um, first of all, um, uh, what's become very clear is that um, uh, that AI is going to be very capable in the future. And I mentioned in the talk that there are people developing software right now, which um, will eventually be there. We don't know when, but it will be there. So, a bit like the self-driving car. We don't know exactly when it will be fully self-driving, but we know that eventually it will be self-driving. So maybe translate that first. Right. Então, então ele disse que não, não está claro é, quando a inteligência artificial será capaz de realizar isso, mas nós sabemos que no futuro ela, ela será capaz. Mas não, não dá para saber o momento exato de quando isso vai acontecer. But what is interesting uh, already is the fact that um, X Cool has been asked to, uh, in, in a competition, to check the, uh, the the competition entries to see how they are performing, their cost, and so on. Então, o que é interessante é ele ver, por exemplo, empresas como a X Cool que está na competição, é, integrando coisas como custo uh, e outros e outros fatores. Num concurso, so, ele quer dizer, né? Sorry. Uh... Como que a x dentro de um concurso de arquitetura, pode uh, uh, mediar isso e, e avaliar uh, a performance de cada um dos, das, das entries, né, das, dos participantes? Sorry, Neil. So, I mean, once it can check the performance of a design, then the next step is to produce a design where it's already conforming to those performance requirements. In other words, structural performance, environmental performance, uh, 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 economic cost performance and so on, which tends to suggest that actually, or very soon, all these professions will be integrated in one single platform. The engineer, the quantities of air, uh, the environmental control um, uh, engineer and so on. So it will all become together on a single platform. Ou seja, uh, se ele avaliar, sorry, ele pode, então, também começar a projetar né? e, e integrar todas as profissões. Mais ou menos isso, não sei se recado que é complementar. Sim, que todas elas vão estar integradas numa única plataforma. Was you speak uh, Latin, Latin, too. Maybe he understands a bit of Portuguese. Uh? O Nil fala latim, pode entender alguma coisa, eu acho. Mas not, not exactly to speak, né? Not, cannot, uh, não pode falar, mas... I think he understands something, right, Neil? Uh -huh. Yeah. What's, what's the, there's a second part of the question, right, um, Ricardo? Marina? Um, havia uma segunda parte da pergunta, Marina, que não ficou claro? No, well, the culture, just sorry. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the question yeah. cultural, yeah. culture. Yeah. The, yeah, I think that, that it's that's a difficult question, but what I would say is that the data already controls, contains aspects of culture. I mean, Typically now everyone criticizes AI because it's bias, you know? um, but actually it gets the biases from, from, from us, from human culture. So it, embedded in the data are already those cultural values uh, for good or for bad. Então, ele acha que é uma pergunta muito crítica. No entanto, os dados já contêm aspectos da nossa cultura. Né? Então, esse, esse bias ele é um, algo que acaba sendo inerente dos, dos dados. Só deixa eu complementar uh, os nossos testes, nossa pesquisa, né, Ricardo? Uh, e isso, a questão do bias que vira um problema, às vezes, depende da quantidade de dados, da fonte dos dados que estão sendo uh, usados no modelo, né? Então, 
Atualmente, inclusive, o, o DALI e o Journey, eles já fazem disclosure. Uh, there's a disclosure on, the, on those models right now that uh, they uh, are warning about bias. They, they didn't solve this problem. Né? Eles não resolveram o problema do bias, que, que tem a ver com, com a cultura em geral, ou, ou uh, um pouco com relação às minorias, algumas questões de quando colocava ah, uma enfermeira, tá, 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 sempre aparecia uma mulher branca, a loira, né? então existe toda essa bias que está carregando também questões culturais. Tanto que outra coisa, another thing is that the prompts are all, all in English, that they didn't translate it yet to, to other languages, so this is maybe another point of uh, bias. É. Uh, então, não existe but... tradução para outras línguas, yeah. né? So Ainda. There, you cannot, Portuguese people cannot use uh, Midjourney or Dali in their own language. A gente não consegue usar na nossa própria língua. Então, isso também é uma, uma limitação. Uh, this is a limitation that exists on, under these systems. Existe nesses sistemas. Yes, yeah, so, uh, uh, they... Although there is now a Chinese platform that can do that, so eventually there will be Portuguese. Maybe I should say something about bias. I mean, there's a kind of analogy you can draw between self-driving cars and bias. In other words, uh, the thing about the self-driving car, as uh, Yuval Harari points out, that actually it's actually it's potentially going to be better than us at driving. Um, there was a case when a, a Google car was crashed into by a human driver. And, and basically, you will improve the technology but you will never improve the, the distractedness of a human driver who will crash. Um, and maybe the same happens with bias. You could kind of maybe clean it out of the system by recalibrating, but we will always be biased ourselves. Um, então, é, o, o que eu entendi é que ele disse que é, os carros automáticos, eles serão, por exemplo, dirigidos muito melhor do que nós. Né? E houve até um fato onde um carro do Google bateu em um outro carro, um carro autodirigível, um carro desses automáticos, bateu em outro carro, e, era um, e era, foi por causa que o humano estava dirigindo. Então, significa que o, o, o carro automático dirigia melhor é, do, que o, do que o próprio ser humano. Né? Acho que a questão também é que, é que quer dizer que a gente carrega nosso próprio bias. Né? We, uh -huh. we, we, we carry our bias. Uh, for more than for as long as the computer can be perfect, he's got, if it is based on us, it's going to bring those bias. Então, se, se ele depender da gente, a gente não vai estar tá trazendo esses, esses preconceitos. We have to fix this in ourselves too, right? So we can be more uh, equalitarian. Né? A gente tem que uh, um problema da humanidade também. Então. Maybe I could add something. A lot of people like to attack AI. Um, Uh, and they like to think of maybe it's evil or you know, whatever. It's very dangerous. Um, uh, but I don't think it, it, in itself it's dangerous at all. It's just a tool. Um, you, it's the question of how you use it and for what. Um, my problem about, and, and let's say a, a knife, a kitchen knife, you can cut up vegetables or you can murder someone. It's nothing evil about it. My concern about AI is it's so capable It's so capable. It's showing up our own our own limitations as architects, as designers, in many ways. Então, o problema não é... Bom, fala um bocado. É, não. Uh, algumas pessoas, elas atacam a inteligência artificial, né? Dizendo que a inteligência artificial é perigosa, que ela é malvada. Uh, mas ele não acha que ela é perigosa. A questão é como você usa ela e para quê. Né? Então, por exemplo, numa cozinha, você poderia pegar uma, uma faca e cortar os vegetais, usar para cozinhar, ou poderia pegar a faca e usar para assassinar, matar alguém. Né? Então, a, a grande questão é como se usa. Né? Tem alguma coisa que gostaria de acrescentar, Angélica? Não, não. Perfeito. Então, so maybe I could, could I, um, make a, add another point. I mean, so um, I first became, I think, terrified by AI when I was boarding a, a flight uh, in Los Angeles and uh, they, they were testing out a facial recognition camera. And I came with my boarding pass and I showed it to the flight attendant. And she said, no, don't, you don't need that, just look at this panel. And it recognized me. It recognized me from every single other person on the planet. Now that is terrifying, that is terrifying. And of course you can use these mechanisms of facial recognition for surveillance in a bad way. In some cultures, they will use it to control a population. But also, you know, facial recognition is very convenient. You know, this, this my, my phone opens because of, of, of uh, facial recognition. 
And as I mentioned in the talk, I, I entered the United States last time without my passport, just by recognizing my face. So the technology is incredibly capable. It's terrifyingly capable. It's not evil in itself, but it's terrifyingly capable. Uh, então, outro ponto que ele gostaria de adicionar é que ele ficou um pouco assustado com a inteligência artificial, foi quando ele perdeu um voo em Los Angeles e ele chegou com o passaporte dele, mostrou para o atendente e o atendente disse, não, é, olha para essa, essa tela. E o, o sistema reconheceu ele diferentemente de qualquer outra pessoa do mundo. Então, isso causa um certo impacto, principalmente porque esse, esse tipo de ferramenta pode ser usado para vigilância das pessoas, controlação, controle da população, né? Uh, o celular, por exemplo, dele, a gente abre o celular com reconhecimento facial. Uh, então, esse foi um ponto que pode ser, pode ser o perigo da inteligência artificial. Tem alguma coisa, Angélica, que eu perdi, de repente? Não, não, acho que é isso. É, é ao mesmo tempo que a gente que pode usar para o mal, pode ser usado para o bem, né? E isso impressiona e causa um impacto uh, nas pessoas, eu acho que... Uhum. Uh, eu acho que a gente poderia ir para a próxima. Quem sabe o nosso próximo? Isso. Até o next one. Uh, Lorena, por favor. Please, Lorena, can make your first question. Olá, pessoal. Primeiramente, agradecer o convite. É um prazer estar participando do evento. É, a palestra né, do, do, do professor Nil foi bem didática e, ao mesmo tempo, inspiradora. É, a minha pergunta é, vai no sentido de que, cada vez mais, os projetos de arquitetura eles estão associados né, ao modelo geométrico tridimensional, por exemplo, como a metodologia BIM, né, o Building Information Modeling. É, e a gente viu, inclusive, na palestra, que os exemplos explicitados de, de inteligência artificial é, estão bem associados às imagens bidimensionais, né, Midjourney e etc. É, e a gente também vê né, já, já, que já existem ferramentas de varredura tridimensional que forma o modelo de nuvem de pontos, por exemplo, a partir de elementos existentes. Então, minha pergunta vai nesse sentido, se a inteligência artificial vai, vai chegar lá, né? ou se, inclusive, já chegou, né? se já existem estudos para que esse algoritmo né, forneça o um modelo de nuvem de pontos ou qualquer outro modelo na forma é, tridimensional. É, vou, vou, vou traduzir aqui para o professor. Uh, thank you, professor Neil. Uh, your presentation was very didactic, didactic and uh, at the same time very inspiring for us. Uh, and um, I want to see a, a, a question, uh, ask a question. Uh, uh, architectural projects are more associated with the three-dimensional geometric model, such as uh, beam methodology. Uh, and the explicit examples of AI that exist today are related to two-dimensional images. Uh, since there are already three-dimensional raster tools that form the point cloud model from existing elements, uh, do you think uh, AI will get there? Are, are there already studies for the algorithm, the prompt to provide the point cloud model or any other three-dimensional model? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, already, what's interesting is you can develop a tool, but then the other, what, and you can predict the tool, but you can't predict how people are using it. Um, and one thing I would say is people are being very inventive already. They are connecting uh, uh, the, these uh, diffusion models with Grasshopper. So they're already um, three dimensionalizing um, the image. But you know, uh, yeah, let me finish there for a moment. Yeah. Uh, então a gente pode desenvolver a ferramenta, mas a gente não pode prever como que as pessoas vão usar a ferramenta. E ele deu um exemplo onde há pessoas, há pesquisadores já ligando esses modelos de difusão com o Grasshopper, por exemplo. Né? Então, eventualmente, a gente vai chegar lá e ele acredita que as pessoas realmente já estão fazendo isso. Angélica? The, the, in a way, the, the problem with architects is we're completely based on images, right? We, we as ourselves as a discipline. And uh, it, 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 nobody was paying attention to AI when it wasn't producing interesting images. Suddenly, with these diffusion models, we get really fantastic images. But I, do, I, I, I just want to repeat something. I think this, this, what we're seeing now, is just a sketching tool. It's kind of meaningless in some ways. But what we have down the road is something far more significant, far more significant. Um, and, and I know 
because I know the people who are developing it. One of my doctoral candidates is, is developing this software. So for example, let me just give you one example. At the moment, when we, we operate, let's say it's Zaha's office. Um, you First of all, you produce something in Maya, then you model it in Rhino, then you model it in BIM, and then you do all these other things. These are as discrete operations. What's going to happen? It's going to be one continuous platform where we're going from data to fabrication. And actually, BIM won't exist anymore. There will be no more BIM. It will be, all be integrated in this platform. Uh, então, ele acha que o, os a, a profissão de arquitetura, por si só, sempre foi muito baseada em imagens e ninguém estava interessado na inteligência artificial antes das imagens. É, no entanto, esses modelos de difusão estão é, gerando imagens incríveis e é, no começo a gente parecia, agora, na percepção dele, parece que é só apenas uma ferramenta de sketch, né, de desenho rápido, é, mas as coisas vão ser muito mais significantes. E ele deu um exemplo onde um dos alunos de doutorado dele está de, tá desenvolvendo um software, onde, por exemplo, está uh, desenvolvendo um software e, e no futuro é, você, vai pro, você vai produzir no Maya, vai modelar um pouco no BIM, no, no Rhino. Então, todas essas coisas vão ser, é, digamos que, integradas em uma única plataforma. Ele disse que hoje, hoje já são usados várias, vários programas, né? Várias, e que no futuro uh -huh. vai ser integrado. Obrigado, Jair. Então, eu acho que esse é o aspecto mais fascinante da AI. O que eles vão fazer no futuro? Eu estava pensando que todos eles estão pensando em fazer isso agora. Eu acho que todos eles estão pensando em fazer isso agora. Eu acho que todos eles estão pensando em fazer isso agora. Eu acho que todos eles estão pensando em fazer isso agora. Eu acho que todos eles estão pensando The most popular ones are the ones about design, about images. And when we talk about the office, nobody's so interested in it. But the office of the future is going to be incredibly interesting. How it's going to operate, how it's going to change, it's really important. And I think that it, as educators, we really have to be aware of that because we're training uh, students today who are going to be working in offices right when AI comes to, it's, it comes to, to be so dominant. Uh, então, o que ele acha que é fascinante é que todos os, todo mundo está cooperando, trabalhando uh, e saem essas imagens. Uh, eu não sei, você pode, consegue me ajudar um pouco, Angélica? Ele quer bit. dizer que o, o mais importante vai ser, então, as mudanças que vão ocorrer, ocorrer nos escritórios de arquitetura, né? que por enquanto uh -huh. estão só todos em imagens, mas que as, que as pessoas não dão tanta importância para o que está acontecendo nos escritórios mas que isso é que vai ter a mudança mais importante e mais significativa, como os escritórios vão operar e vão estar desenvolvendo. Uh, I actually can compliment you, you if, you, if you let me uh, your uh, answer. Uh, I'm quite enthusiastic about the, the diffusion models, as, as you know. Uh, well, regarding the, your question, Lorena, uh, many of the, the platforms, that the people that are working are trying to three-dimensionalize the, the images with depth maps, but uh, they're just images. They're just like, a, uh, it's like a, we don't, you don't, you cannot uh, even uh, put it into 2D uh, drawings or designs. And some people are trying to connect it to Grasshopper, but it's still, they're just picking up images from one side to the other. The, the 3D of the, the, specifically from the image is not uh, on, on the, the market yet, but the people are, are working with it. And what we are on our research with our research group, we are trying to see what information we can extract from those uh, images and, uh, and what can those things tell us, even for bias or cultural or uh, specifically with uh, climate and, and uh, responsive things. That what else we can we get from that, from those images uh, beyond the, the aesthetics? But that's, that's our, uh, our speculation. Uh, so, do, do, do you want uh, to say it in Portuguese? Yes. A minha nossa pesquisa que o Ricardo, a Sara, a Sara's uh, masters uh, uh, que nós estamos tentando fazer, tent, uh, ver o que, que a gente consegue extrair dessas imagens, né? Além da simplesmente da parte estética, né? Tanto com relação a bias ou, ou, ou a questão cultural ou mesmo de sustentabilidade, se elas não estão nos dando aquela foram geradas uma série de bancos de dados específicos. Então, o que, é que, se, o que, é que essas, essas imagens vão, vão poder nos dizer? Né? Como que a gente consegue ler elas? Né? Um, this one thing, and, que mais que eu falei? Que eu, agora já me perdi. Acho que era isso, né? Bom, 
I think I guess that's that's his... ah, e, e os mapas uh, a questão dos mapas né uh, como que eles estão traduzindo para o 3D a gente está tá vendo muito o pessoal trabalhar com depth maps você iria pega a imagem ela fica tridimensionalizada mas toda a parte de trás da imagem não existe ela fica é como se tivesse dado uma volumetria né uma sensação de volumetria uh, mas não é exatamente um, um volume ainda e tem alguns uh, algumas plataformas que estão começando a lançar tem um que chama Tidin Uh, que eles estão tentando conectar também com o Grasshopper, mas ainda são imagens 2D levadas para o 3D e tentando imaginar e tridimensionalizar aquilo. Então, as coisas estão acontecendo. Uh, que eu, I cannot say the, how fast they're going to be happening, uh, because sometimes I think they're going to take longer time, and then all of a sudden, boom, something new happens. So you can never, can never tell, right? A gente não consegue dizer, daqui a pouco, do nada, aparece uma novidade que a gente não estava esperando. As coisas estão mudando muito, muito rápido. And I guess one of the hardest parts of, of everything new is like you, you were talking before, how do you write a book or how do you write an article? Uh, <laughs> and how can you keep pace of all, all those changes? Uh, all of a sudden, when you finish writing something, it's already uh, not, it's uh, outdated. Né? Então, a gente vai escrevendo e as coisas vão se desatualizando. A gente, quando a gente termina um artigo, um livro, mais ainda, the book takes longer time, a gente terminou e eles já se perderam o tempo, porque as, as mudanças estão acontecendo muito, muito rápidas. Né? I guess. But yeah, but just to say that I showed you at the beginning of the lecture some covers of some books, and this year they all came out. Uh, these books, they took three years or four years to produce, right? So we were working for a long time, and suddenly they came out at the beginning of this year. But they're all out of date because of, of, of these diffusion platforms. The images are nowhere near as good as they are today and the problem of books is that not only does it take so long to get the contract and to write them but it takes 12 months to actually produce the book from when you submit the manuscript in other words we need something like a google doc kind of book that can be updated regularly otherwise we'll be out of date but yeah that's the problem é. Então, os livros que ele mostrou durante a apresentação, uh, eles já estavam sendo produzidos há dois, três anos, mas todos saíram esses anos, e ele disse ainda que todos eles estão depracados, estão atrasados, né? Que o problema dos livros é que eles demoram muito para produzir, uh, então você precisa mandar com 12 meses antes o manuscrito, né? Uh, e o que seria ideal é que, como se tivesse um Google Docs, onde a pessoa sempre estivesse atualizando ele. Né? To go back to the, the, the 2D question, I mean, I think we shouldn't overlook the fact that, that architecture has until very recently always been 2D. A plan, a section, an elevation, a pers perspective, they're all 2D. And that was until recently. So in fact, Stanislaw Chailu has been exploring the, uh, when he was a student at Harvard, he's developed something called Archigans, which was based, based on plans. And you can work in two dimensions to some extent using it that way. That's Ricardo's research. Go ahead, Ricardo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, então, ele gostaria de é, comentar que a gente tem que, tem que olhar para o fato também de que a arquitetura ela sempre foi bidimensional. Né? Uh, então, ele cita um exemplo do Chilo Stanislas, que é um pesquisador que terminou o doutorado dele na Universidade de Harvard recentemente, onde ele, é, ele cita isso também, né? que a arquitetura, a, a primeira forma de documentação de arquitetura foi 2D, e ele trabalha com inteligência artificial na geração de plantas. Uh, Neil, I, I'd like to complement uh, to this answer, because uh, I made a, res a master's research and I really focused on Chilo Stanislas research. And uh, I think that uh, by the time that he did this research, we only had, for example, pix to pix but I imagine, which is um, a processing method, but I imagine that now that we have, for example, these diffusion models, I think things in the future are going to get further. So one, one example I would add is, for example, uh, the uh, Theodor Galenos. So his research, he made a research which is similar, where he connects natural language processing and floor plans. Uh, so I think things are going to get more a little bit in this sense of connecting data, uh, writing text, putting audio, and uh, will develop in this sense. Uh, então, o que eu complementei é que uh, nessa, nessa pesquisa do Chilo Stanislas, onde ele gera plantas baixas com inteligência artificial, 
É, existem outras pesquisas paralelas, onde, por exemplo, um pesquisador chamado Theodor Galanos, ele conecta a geração de plantas baixas com processamento de linguagem natural. Então, hoje a gente tem uma plataforma que a gente escreve um texto e ele gera uma imagem de fachada ou do que você estiver pedindo. É, no futuro, também terão sistemas muito melhores para se gerar não só a fachada, mas também a planta baixa, um corte, é, o que for. Né? Can I say something about, about the future a little bit? Uh, well, uh, Theodor is actually uh, I'm one of the, the doctoral design pro, uh, the students at the FIU. Um, uh, he's not he's an engineer, he's not an architect. And I think that what we're discovering is architects are not uh, quite as forward thinking as we think, not quite as creative as we think. For example, in the School of Architecture, we spend our whole time talking about the past. We like to think we're futuristic. But actually, we spend our time talking about Vitruvius and Alberti and so on. We need to change that orientation towards the future. And secondly, it, we, we think we're, we're getting creative. I don't think we're so creative. I think that already that uh, these diffusion platforms have shown, shown up our lack of creativity in that somebody using a diffusion platform is better than an architect not using one. So I think these are exposing our limitations as architects. We like to think we're creative and futuristic, but we're not, probably. We're gonna get a lot of enemies now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, então, ele, ele disse que, na verdade, os arquitetos, eles podem acabar não sendo muito criativos, né? De que ele critica um pouco o fato de que a gente passa muito tempo na universidade estudando, pensando sobre o passado, mas a gente precisa mudar essa orientação e começar a pensar mas é para o futuro. Uh, então, e ele, e ele, ele fala que essa, essas plataformas acabam demonstrando um pouco essa falta de criatividade. Então, que a gente precisa mudar um pouco esse mindset. Uh, eu gostaria de passar para a oportunidade para o José, Pedro, fazer, uma, fazer seus comentários, suas perguntas também. Uh, so, I'd like to go to José Pedro Souza. Thank you for your presence here, José. Uh, so, it's your time. Okay. okay. Well, uh, muito obrigado a todos pelo, pelo convite. Thank you very much, all of you, for the invitation. Thank you, Neil, for your great uh, presentation. Before this uh, meeting today, I went back to, to, to check again your book from 20 years ago about designing for a digital world. So we are still designing for a digital world, but not alone anymore, no? We are with artificial intelligence right now. So, portanto, nós estamos hoje a, a projetar, a continuar a projetar para o mundo digital. Foi o título de um livro do Neil há 20 anos atrás, mas desta vez não estamos sozinhos, né? estamos com a inteligência artificial num momento em que de facto parece estar a impactar a nossa profissão como arquiteto. Uh, aquilo que eu tinha para, uh, neste momento, gostaria de fazer aqui um comentário e uma pergunta. I would like to, to make a comment and uh, one question. Uh, o comentário é só para fazer aqui uma ponta à pergunta da Marina no início. Nós no Porto também começamos a explorar a inteligência artificial com o Mid Journey e eu lancei um exercício aos alunos, a 24 alunos, para projetarem uma casa com o Mid Journey com uma série de requisitos específicos e no final fiquei surpreendido porque apesar de todas aquelas imagens serem absolutamente novas, originais, as geometrias dos edifícios que eles obtiveram eram todas muito parecidas. E, portanto, fiquei ali com uma primeira impressão, que ainda não tive tempo de pensar, de que, de facto, não é? ali, aquele algoritmo, para além de servir para cada um deles ver algo de novo, no coletivo, pareceu uma espécie de espelho da cultura daquele grupo de estudantes que estão a aprender arquitetura todos juntos no mesmo, no mesmo sítio. E, portanto, de certa maneira, aquilo do, do bias, não é? da... da da tendência da tecnologia, de facto, carrega, não é? somos nós que também a carregamos. Well, my, my comment is because in Porto, we, we started exploring mid journey in the course, and I launched an assignment to 24 students about designing, finding the design of a house with, this, with the same criteria or requirements. And in the end, I was surprised because the responses that they got They were all original, but from the geometric or formal point of view, they were very similar. They were kind of boxes with flat walls. So suddenly, I didn't have time yet to reflect on that, but it, for me it was very interesting because suddenly it looks like the, the mid-journey 
serve to reflect as a mirror the kind of culture that those students have in common because they are from the same, let's say, uh, country, they are being taught in the same school, so maybe their interests are similar and suddenly this was, uh, uh, for, for now it's what looks like, it, it, it revealed, no, this experience revealed also the culture of that classroom, which I find interesting and I want to still reflect it about it more. And it gets to your comment that um, the, the, the technology gets the bias from us, no? So uh, then my, my question and the, the discussion has been very interesting so far, so I'll try to, to have a different question now. Uh, it's, uh, it uh, is about style. Uh, when Patrick Schumacher looks into computational design, he was, let's say, tried to define a new style it's called parametricism. Of course, not all of us that use uh, parametric design are developing this kind of twisted and variable buildings, but of course, he found some similarities and he coined this, this style. And uh, when we look into these GAN uh, movies, and also when we look into mid-journey, more still frames of uh, evolution, of explorations, sometimes it looks like that uh, those images share some aesthetic uh, uh, qualities. So my question is, do you think artificial intelligence can also support or trigger a new style? And also, um, we are, uh, I would like to bring another topic that is hot today, which is the metaverse. And um, I recall Markus Novak in the end of the 90s, 90s saying that virtual spaces shouldn't be designed the same as the physical spaces because the conditions are totally different. Do you think? these explorations with GANs and Midjourney, um, instead of being used to be simplified and driven towards a physical building, could actually be used to feed the aesthetics of a metaverse and find there in the virtual space, the right space to evolve and eventually be more dynamic than they are in this uh, experiment. So maybe I could quickly explain in Portuguese my, my, my question. Uh, so, portanto, a minha questão tem a ver com a ideia do Patrick Schumacher olhar para o desenho paramétrico e, e, e apontar aqui a hipótese de um novo estilo, o parametricismo, e eu perguntava ao Neil se uh, a inteligência artificial, quando nós vemos todas estas animações de GAN, de Midjourney, vemos que parece que há ali uma estética a emergir, Será que a inteligência artificial pode suportar a emergência de uma nova estética também? E depois fazia a ponta aqui para o metaverso, né? este espaço virtual que falamos muito hoje, e que eu recordo-me de um arquiteto, Marcos Nova, que criticava muito aqueles arquitetos que faziam simulações virtuais, replicando as imagens e a estética do mundo físico, e eu perguntava se o metaverso não poderia ser um território exatamente para que estas explorações da inteligência artificial, em vez de, e isso é uma aplicação obviamente muito interessante, em vez de serem depois simplificadas para conduzirem um edifício físico, se não poderiam ser também a fonte para a estética, uma estética do metaverso. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so first of all, um, I actually, back in 1999, a long time ago, I published a book called The Anesthetics of Architecture that came out also in Portuguese, where I was criticizing, criticizing the, the obsession with the image and representation in architectural culture. Maybe someone could draw that out. Uh, então, em 1999, ele publicou um livro onde ele critica a, a questão da, da imagem como representação. And I think that remains remains a problem. We we are obsessed with images and architecture, and actually, I'm interested in looking beyond that question to how things operate. So let me just put to you the question. Um, I mean, okay. So another book which I produced was Digital Futures, um, 
which was interesting because Patrick Schumacher launched his notion of parametricism in that issue, where he was saying that the future of the city is going to be parametric. Well, it hasn't been parametric. But what was interesting about that, uh, art, uh, the AD on digital cities, is the final article by Benjamin Bratton, where he talks about, he's called iPhone City, he talks about how the iPhone allows us to navigate the city in completely different ways. So I'll stop there, I'll have some more to say. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I lost myself a little bit. Uh, então, ele acha que esse problema tem esse problema da representação, né? E ele gosta de ver um pouco além de como as pessoas, como as coisas operam. Uh, você consegue me ajudar um pouco, Angélica, nesse ponto? Uh, porque ele produziu um outro livro do Digital Futures, onde o Patrick Schumacher, e daí eu me perdi um pouco. Sorry, I was looking for his book. <laughs> <laughs> I got lost uh, the last part of your question. Yeah. Could you, could you come know. back a little bit? Eu posso, ah. posso ajudar. Portanto, esse livro que o Neil uh, publicou, primeiro publicou um, a Anestética da, da Arquitetura, onde falava da obsessão dos arquitetos com a imagem, e depois esse mais tarde, o Digital Future, foi um livro onde o Patrick Schumacher, pela primeira vez, lançou essa ideia do, do parametricismo, muito aplicado ao desenho das cidades, e que, e que segundo o Neil, ainda hoje não se verifica dessa forma. E, e o Neil chamava a atenção para um último artigo dessa, 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 dessa publicação, do Benjamin Bratton, onde ele uh, aí uh, tem, tem uma posição uh, diferente sobre essa, sobre essa questão. So maybe I could put to you, um, what will the city of the future look like? Will it look something out of Zaha office? Will it look something out of the Jetsons? Or will it look like the city of today? I mean, maybe a few additional more buildings, new buildings, but essentially all the buildings uh, and all the city retrofitted with the latest technology. Let me put that question to you. Então, como como que a cidade do futuro vai parecer? Será que vai ser como os prédios da Zaha Hadid ou como os Jetsons do desenho, né? Ou a gente vai ter mais edifícios como são hoje também, talvez com retrofit? Uh, ele colocou a pergunta de volta para você, José. Como você acha que ela vai ser? So, so I mean, so what ah, I would... Um, no. <laughs> oh, sorry. Keep going. The... Oh, no, I thought you sent the question back for him. Oh, no, no, no. Well, uh, let, me, okay, the... <laughs> let me just add one thing first. Uh, uh, okay. Um, so, um, I, I don't think there's going to be a style of, of, of AI. And I, I'm very critical of, of Mario Carpo, who is an architectural historian at the Barton, who thinks there should be a style of big data. And because big data is messy, it's a messy architectural style. I, I think if we want to understand big data, we don't look at images, we think about processes and how information is being processed. So if we think about, let's say, Uber car, does an Uber car look different to an ordinary car? No because it is an ordinary car. But what's different is the way that it's operating. It's using AI to, to do many different sort of ways. It's, it's, so I think when we're thinking about the future, we need to think about different ways of operating, not about different styles. Uh, então, ele não acha que terá um estilo da arquitetura. Ele, por exemplo, cri critica um pouco um outro autor chamado Mário Carpo, onde ele cita que existe um estilo do Big Data, o um estilo de... Uh, onde o Big Data é confuso, é bagunçado, então também teremos uma arquitetura confusa, bagunçada. Mas é, ele questiona, por exemplo, é, o que, que existe de diferente de um carro da Uber, um carro autodirigível, não sei, de um outro carro normal, né? Então, a questão não é, de repente, a aparência, mas sim a maneira que ele opera. Fez sentido? Can I, can I complement one thing? Uh, there's, uh, there's one thing that we already know, that uh, uh, most of these uh, diffusion models, they were made having a database uh, greatly influenced by arts. And graphics, so they have a lot of. They, they know the uh, they, they I'm personalizing, it, but it knows uh, the the name of artists and not that much of architects. So uh, and this and they are uh, they were opening first for free these 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 models to artists to test them, especially much more than architects. So architects are, are uh, discovering now that it's its potentials, but 
uh, it still is just like loaded with with the uh, arts and so, and because of that it has some aesthetics especially mid journey but the latest mid journey uh, version the version 4 they uh, upgraded and then now they have a, a larger database and they include some architects and some designers not not much uh, like the most famous architects but a little bit of designers so it's starting to change so th that's why you're feeling of uh, of a style i don't think it's specifically from your students but the way mid journey was built and, and was operating and you can see different styles, uh, different uh, outcomes from DALI and Journey and Stable Diffusion, and they are changing really fast and, and becoming uh, more viable. So, o que eu quero dizer então é que esses estilos dos modelos atuais que existem, né, Journey, DALI e o Stable Diffusion, eles iniciaram muito baseados em artistas e na, nas artes gráficas. E então eles adquiriram, talvez por isso, uma forte conotação nesse sentido. E poucos nomes de arquitetos ou imagens de arquitetura uh, têm nesses, nessas, nesses databases. Então, uh, e especialmente o Midjourney, ele começou a gerar, várias pessoas uh, começaram a se dar conta de uma espécie de estética própria, que agora vem mudando, porque, por exemplo, o Midjourney está na versão 4 e eles aumentaram o database, aumentaram as, as referências e isso está se aperfeiçoando e mudando muito rapidamente. Mas a gente consegue identificar a diferença uh, de uso de estética entre uh, Midjourney, Dali e Stable Diffusion. And you can also mix them. Uh, and you can start money much from Just one that. and put it to the other, and then you're gonna get something else. So it's it's nice to start um, exploring those. Now, você pode misturar, então, a imagem de um, fazer input na outra, explorar isso, então, para dar uma riqueza maior. Maybe I can just respond to that. Um, so, yeah, the moment, I mean, this, the, the GPT-3 is a massive, massive um, pre-trained model, and it's not for architects, it's a general one, and it doesn't recognize the names of, 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 of many architects, in fact, very few architects it will, it, will, it will recognize. And even when you have an architect, I, I, actually, I think, if I want to do a building in the, in, in the style of Zaha Hadid, it's better to go and put a description or in words a description of what Zaha designs and that's more accurate. I, I use a description that Patrick Schumacher he used to describe what they do in the office and it's much more effective than putting in the style of Zaha Hadid. That's one point. Yeah. Uh, então, ele está dizendo que o modelo da GPT-3, por exemplo, que é um robô que conversa com as pessoas, uh, é um modelo pré-treinado massivo, muito grande, e, mas é um modelo generalizado. Uh, o que ele quer dizer com isso é que ele não é específico para arquitetura, ele não reconhece até muito, o nome de muitos arquitetos. Então, por exemplo, se ele quisesse projetar um edifício uh, que fosse parecido com a da Zaha Hadid, ele não, de repente não precisaria usar o Zaha Hadid, mas sim usar uma descrição que descrevesse os projetos dela, né? Uh, acho que mais so, ou menos uh, isso. So, I mean, um, it, they, they are producing them now with more that have been trained on architects, but I actually think that the, the, the real potential of these platforms is not to replicate existing buildings by existing architects, but to use the platform as a way of opening up new possibilities in the future. So whenever I um, use uh, uh, Midjourney, I, I don't ref, refer to architects, but I, I refer to other, um, maybe flowers, orchids, for example. What happens when you cross Zaha with an orchid or with a thundercloud or whatever? And that's really opening things up. It's what we call extrapolating. If you just uh, operate as existing data set, it'll only look inwards. So I think breeding is the real possibility where it will shake us into thinking about new uh, architectural expressions. Uh... Então, só um minutinho, uh, o, o potencial, na verdade, da inteligência artificial não é ficar replicando a arquitetura, mas ela abre novas possibilidades uh, para os arquitetos. Então, não, não, por exemplo, você é, utilizar prompts, em vez de usar o nome do arquiteto, uh, você usar com flores ou misturar as coisas. E é, é, é realmente essa mistura onde a gente extrapola, né? Uh, e, pelo que eu entendi é isso, é isso. <risos> é. Uh, eu gostaria de estar tá encaminhando like a, só só para complementar I think you, what you're saying that it's getting starting to get interested start designing with it as a tool like conversing with them, the tool and and with inputs outputs and uh, and uh, phrases that you can start building up on the on the model right not just putting a, a, a one prompt and that's it but getting what you have back and then you 
you you input again and then you start evolving into it and you start like designing with the AI and that that's the the when it gets more interesting I think right então é, é o mais interessante quando a gente consegue projetar com a AI então a gente escreve devolve ou coloca uma imagem input então a gente começa a melhorar e, e elaborar em cima do mesmo modelo né ah, numa conversa com a inteligência artificial e aí que fica mais interessante mais entusiasmante até I get really excited when I'm doing it. <laughs> Ok. É, eu gostaria de estar encaminhando é, para as últimas perguntas. Eu, a gente tem algumas perguntas no YouTube. So I'd like to uh, go ahead into the end of the session uh, with some YouTube questions. Então, nós temos a pergunta do Tiago Tavares. Ele diz em que eu sou professor de BIM nos cursos de arquitetura e engenharia no interior da Paraíba, no Brasil. So he's a, a professor uh, that uses BIM technology in the courses of architecture and engineering in the interior of the Paraíba State of Brazil. É Thiago uh, Cavalcante. Uh, Felipe oh, Tavares é outro. <laughs> Não misturo, mas... Felipe yeah. Tavares is another question. Already he already contributed with digital features. Tá. And, and that's another uh, person. Ok. Uh, então, a pergunta Thiago dele Cavalcante. é... Qual... Sorry. Obrigado, Angélica. Uh, a pergunta é, qual o ponto da formação do arquiteto qual o ponto da formação do arquiteto se deva ter a inserção da ferramenta da inteligência artificial como métodos auxiliares à concepção de projeto de arquitetura dentro dos cursos superiores? So his question is, in, in what point of the, the graduation process of architects should we insert tools uh, like AI or methods that auxiliate to help the conception of a project in architecture? Uh, in the graduation courses, at what point should we insert these tools? Undergraduate too. I guess he's asking about undergrad. Yeah, yeah. undergraduate um, I think they're already being used. Um, can I just say that mm -hmm. I get essays now that have been generated by AI. I mean, they do it deliberately to show what they can do, but in two years' time, we won't know if our essays have been generated by AI or written by the students. It's, it's infiltrating its way already uh, into the uh, into the way that people operate, but I, I just want to make one kind of general sort of comment about the resistance to um, AI. You know, I studied at Cambridge in the eighties, where um, uh, we weren't allowed to use the computer in the design studio; it was forbidden. Um, uh, and by the time that the two thousand came up, well, the, as a result, Cambridge generated. That's why I studied. Cambridge generated. Uh, a, 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 a graduating class that were unemployable. They couldn't use computation and they were unemployable. By the time 2002, Designing for Digital World, at FOA, a Foreign Office Architects, they were saying, we can't use anyone who can't use computation. They're, anyone over 40 is too old. I'll stop there, but I'll have more to say later. Mm -hmm. uh, então, ele disse que, na verdade, eles já estão sendo usados na, na, nas universidades, né? E que ele já chegou até receber trabalhos de faculdade feitos por inteligência artificial. Escritos, né? Essay. Trabalhos escritos, né? Yes, Artigo. um essay, artigos escritos. Mas existe uma, uma resistência com... Uh, existe uma certa resistência com a inteligência artificial, né? E ele menciona que há, há um tempo atrás os alunos, por exemplo, não eram permitidos usar computadores. Quando ele estudou em, em Cambridge, quando ele estudou em Cambridge, ele não era permitido usar e os alunos depois na sequência também não. Que uma turma inteira ficou desempregada porque não podia, não pode usar o computador, né? Então, uhum. e não aceitavam empregar ninguém com mais de 40 que também não soubesse usar o computador. Yeah. So, go ahead. So, so, to go back to design for digital world, I also I included a comment by Bill Gates. This was 2002. And he made the prediction that by the end of the decade, by 2010, there will be nothing that is untouched by the digital. And uh, to my mind, the same is the case this decade. 2022, we can make the same comment. By the end of the decade, there will be nothing that will be untouched by AI. Angélica? Não, não, porque ele disse que o Bill Gates pronunciou em, no início da década de uh, 2002, 2002 uh, que nada até o fim da década uh, poderia ser usado sem o uso de uh, uh, ferramentas uh, digitais. Ferramentas digitais. E que o Neil uh, prevê que até o final da década, agora de 2020, nada vai ser feito sem o uso de AI, de inteligência artificial. Nada passará Isso. sem ser tocado pela é. inteligência artificial, <risos> né? Exato. 
So and, and I guess it is also there is a question that goes with what you were saying now. So maybe you can just put it together. Well, maybe if I could just put, put, put okay. this. Um, so um, the question is whether it will be it, it, it will just infiltrate its way into to architectural culture. I mean, a bit like spell check, right? Spell check came along and it was incredibly useful, and we just adopted it. Or will we have to teach people and, and impose it? And will it be the case, for example, in, as I mentioned in that, that talk, that professional indemnity insurance will insist that architects use AI, a bit like spell check, to make sure mistakes are not, not made? I, I don't, know if it, don't know if we know the answer to that just yet. Uh, we can predict the tool, but we can't predict the way in which it's been used from a cultural point of view. That's a bit of a mystery. Então, a inteligência artificial vai acabar, vai acabar se infiltrando na arquitetura. Ele deu o exemplo do corretor ortográfico, né? onde as pessoas começaram a usar e chegou um ponto onde a gente já não, não fica mais sem ele. Né? E eu não sei se, se chega o ponto que isso vai ter que ser uh, imposto, imposto ou não, ou não né? uh, mas ele não coloca o exemplo... Não tem como prever do... como as pessoas vão usar. Né? Uhum. Não e... tem. Acho que a gente poderia ir para outra pergunta, Angélica. Mas a, a outra pergunta outra... é complementar a essa. The, the ah, essa? next question is complemented by us. more or less okay. the same because it, it asked like uh, technophobia that you mentioned in your book. Would it be one of the greatest obstacles that uh, AI is going to uh, face in the implementation and the profession in the architecture schools and uh, architecture uh -huh. engineering schools? Então, o Felipe pergunta uma pergunta para o Neil, a tecnofobia que ele menciona no livro. Seriam os maiores obstáculos que a IA vai tentar na implementação da profissão nas escolas de arquitetura e engenharia? That's sort of a complement. Tecnofobia. I mean, I don't think we'll be able to survive without AI. You know, I, it's, it's uh, uh, those people who, at uh, Cambridge, who told us not to use computers in the studio, they're all dead now. <laughs> Things will move on. So I think that we will have to use it. It's, it's a, uh, it'll be impossible to operate without it. Um, yeah. Yeah, just as like our iPhones and telephones right, are not right now. And can you also telephones? You cannot imagine myself without using the... It is really yeah. fast from 10 years to now. Então, não, não, vai ser, não vai ser possível sobreviver sem inteligência artificial, né? Então, os, os arquitetos que ficaram sem aprender computador ficaram ultrapassados, né? Uh, e com a inteligência artificial, ele menciona que vai acontecer, digamos, a mesma coisa. Uh, Angélica, você gostaria de encaminhar, de repente, para o final, final Sim, da sessão uh, ou convidar mais alguém? We are, we're falar? about to finish now, right, Neil? And uh, I would like to thank the presence of the... Uh, I, I, I'm sorry that we couldn't make it uh, longer so you could ask more and more questions, but we have a, a time, time limit. And I am I'm happy that uh, every one of, of you could uh, make a, a statement and, and ask something. But I'd like also for you to say some words before we finish. Uh, so, uh, então, eu queria agradecer a presença dos convidados. Primeiramente, né, por terem aceitado o nosso nosso convite de participar dessa sessão. E fico, lamento, né, a gente não ter mais tempo para poder fazer mais perguntas, mas acredito que todos puderam fazer uh, uma, uma pergunta, pelo menos, e declarar um pouco uh, as suas impressões da inteligência artificial. Uh, e eu gostaria que você fizesse um comentário antes de fechar. E eu gostaria de agradecer a por estar aqui com a gente e compartilhar a sua conhecimento. Uh, on AI and, and to the architecture students uh, in Brazil and Portugal and the Portuguese speaking countries. Então, eu gostaria de agradecer também o Neil e a presença de Nietzsche aqui, poder compartilhar conosco o conhecimento dele sobre inteligência artificial, os, os falantes de, da língua portuguesa, estudantes brasileiros, portugueses e de outros países também. So, uh, I don't know, maybe the, the girls first, as <laughs> Marina, Lorena and José Pedro, please. Bem, pessoal, eu gostaria só de agradecer o convite, foi um prazer ter estado aqui com vocês, né? A gente, estamos todos aprendendo coletivamente, eu acredito que o futuro da, da aplicação da inteligência artificial na arquitetura vai passar um pouco por essa relação de uma inteligência coletiva cooperativa, né? E não somente colaborativa. É, então, enfim, né? Foi um prazer. Neil, thank you so much, very inspiring your presentation and everything. So, Thank you. Could, could I say just one final, like, 
Yeah, you're going yeah. to call it for less, no, no. but you want to comment more? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'll, I'll go at the end. Okay, okay. Great. Sorry, sorry. Lorena? Agradecer também a participação e... e... Uma coisa que a gente, às vezes, luta né, nas nossas faculdades pela inserção é, das tecnologias, seja BIM, metaverso, AI, e às vezes é difícil, mas assistir palestras e participar de eventos como esse nos dá força para continuar lutando <risos> para algo que é, que é fato e que é difícil a gente discutir o óbvio e lutar pelo óbvio dentro das nossas faculdades, muitas vezes mas acho que isso aí é fortalecedor para que a gente continue na luta. <laughs> and thank you so much, Neil, for your inspiring, uh, for this inspiring session. And I'm very happy to be here. And, and the knowledge is, is great in, in, in this session. Thank you so much. José, por favor. Bem, pronto, também queria agradecer aqui esta, esta discussão que houve aqui. Se calhar salientava aqui este desafio, este comentário do Nils, em que referia que devíamos atrever-nos a olhar e a pensar o futuro e não só olhar para o, para o passado. E, e aí se calhar também uma das questões que podemos vir a discutir, não é só como é que a ferramenta está a alterar e a modificar-se à nossa frente, mas como é que ela também nos modifica a nós como pessoas, como seres humanos e como designers. Foi um prazer. Neil, thank you very much for this opportunity to discuss this hot topic. Uh, I wanted to highlight your um, suggestion no, for us to dare to think and discuss the future instead of just looking into the past. And I think one of the questions that in another session we could also discuss is not just how technology is ev evolving in front of us, but also how it is changing ourselves no our perception and the way we relate to to our world because i think artificial intelligence is something different than a knife <laughs> thank you <laughs> definitely okay you go ahead please yeah just so i mean I, I, although i'm based in the states i'm actually from the uk um and uh, in england we we invented football And uh, you guys in Brazil, especially, you took the game of football and made it into an art form. Um, and of course, we also have Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, a Portuguese player who has been very dominant in the world. So, you know, I think really the challenge for these things is how they are taken up elsewhere in the world. And, you know, I, I think we've already seen in terms of the, the Portuguese uh, speaking community, We've seen um, amazing uh, contributions already. I mean, uh, in terms of the metaverse, you know, Mariana Capuccio is possibly the leading person in terms of developing that, that whole domain. And I've also seen, I had an extre extremely talented uh, Brazilian student, uh, Matteo Stancati, uh, who was my master's student. He won the prize. Very, very talented. He's from, he's from Brazil. And he's now established the... Um, the Sunken Blimp platform, which we would use last week for a session on the metaverse. So it's clear to me that the Portuguese speaking world has an enormous contribution to make. And in terms of, in a way, reinventing the profession, because that's what we need to do right now is not to design more buildings, but to design the future of architecture itself. And I'm sure that the Portuguese language uh, community will help and make a huge contribution. Ok, o Neil está dizendo que ele tem certeza né, que a contribuição da comunidade, uh, uh, que, de, como é que a gente diz? Que, uh, não é que fala português? Agora me faltou a palavra. A comunidade que fala uh, português. Luso-falante, não é luso-falante? Luso-falante. Uh, que tem vários talentos, né? inclusive ele cita a Mariana Cabogueira, que teve na nossa primeira talk é, do Digital Futures no nosso canal português, né? que é uma das figuras líderes no, 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 no campo do metaverso, metaverso trabalhou para a Zaha Hadid, e o, o Matheus Stancati, que foi aluno dele de mestrado na Florida International University, ganhou o prêmio de melhor uh, aluno, e que teve na nossa sessão no, no sábado passado sobre o metaverso, que também é extremamente talentoso, é, e que, e que essa, ele tem certeza que a gente vai contribuir e a compensar num, num mundo novo, né, Ricardo? Algo mais? I guess Acho que não. Thank you so much. Thank you for the Obrigado audience. Obrigado a todos.
Obrigado a todos pela presença e and, and for the, our uh, uh, guests. We hope to have you next time for other talks, uh, right? Because we, we keep making talks and, and uh, tutorials all year long. And I, I know Jose Pedro wants to participate uh, more strongly and we can do it with uh, Daniela already. And uh, thank you. Então, muito obrigado a todos, ao José Pedro, né, que espero que vocês também participem mais, em outras vezes, a gente tem talks e tutoriais que vocês podem contribuir, a, a Marina também já é figurinha carimbada aqui, né, a Marina is also is a, a, one of our contributors, and uh, she participated on the, the, the summer festival, right, ela participou no festival de verão com tutoriais e com a escola dela e os trabalhos de pesquisa dela, Podemos também esperar, porque através do Léo, ver mais da, da Lorena e um pouco, and a bit of BIM, you can bring some BIM to the stage too. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then I guess this is it. Thank you so much. Obrigado can a todos. Just, yes. Can I just say also, obrigado to you, um, uh, <laughs> Angelica and the whole team of Digital Futures Portuguese. I think this is so important to open up these debates in other languages and you know we know what contribution that the portuguese world has given us to the world of, of football let's see what it gives us to the world of ai because there is so much talent all over the world and i look forward to seeing who is the new cristiano ronaldo or whatever of the world of ai and uh, don't so thank worry you we're so gonna much. win it we're gonna win it this time <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you, you don't, uh, Brazil doesn't always win, okay? But it plays <laughs> the most attractive football. You know, I was supporting Brazil against Germany because they were so much more beautiful players. And, you know, it's nice yeah, it's to be able to produce a game of football and see how the Brazilian team plays football because it's very special. Thank you. Obrigado. Okay, I think this doesn't need to translate. Better not. 7 1 today, no. Okay. Isso aí, pessoal. Okay. Obrigado a todos. Thank you. Tchau, tchau. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye. Bye, -bye. Yeah. Encerrou, Dani. <laughs>